Hello, good morning. The Metropolitan Police has urged victims of sexual assault to come forward no matter how long ago it happened. The force issued the statement following allegations of sexual assault, rape and coercive control against the comedian Russell Brand, which was published in the Sunday Times and Channel 4's dispatches. The paper says that they are now investigating new allegations from more women who have contacted them. Mr Brand insists that all his relationships were consensual. It's Monday, the 18th of September. The BBC and Channel 4 have announced their own investigations into the former presenter who denies all the allegations against him. Also ahead, in Libya, aid teams scramble to prevent another disaster, the spread of disease. We are in Dedna, where residents are still grappling with the shock of their loss. Raising the flag over liberated territory, Ukrainian forces claim a second significant gain in three days. Labour tells the Prime Minister to reject Liz Truss's honours list, calling it a reward for crashing the economy. And why pandas look so sleepy, new research finds they get jet lag. Hello, good morning. Thanks very much for joining us. The Metropolitan Police has urged victims of sexual assault to come forward no matter how long ago it happened. The force issued a statement following allegations of sexual assault, rape and coercive behaviour against the comedian Russell Brand, which were published by the Sunday Times and Channel 4's dispatches. The paper says they're now investigating new allegations from more women who have contacted them. Mr Brand insists all of his relationships were consensual. Well, our Sky correspondent, Saba Chowdhury, uh, joins me now in the studio. Hi, Saba. Um, so it was a, a shocking revelations that were made in the papers and on dispatches on, on Saturday. What are they both now saying about more women coming forward? Hi there, Jane. So start with a bit of context. So it was over the weekend that a joint investigation led by Channel 4, The Times and The Sunday Times newspaper reported that four women, one as young as 16, at the time of alleging that they were sexually abused by Russell Brand at the height of his career, so between 2006 to 2013. Some of their accusations include uh, rape and also coercive, abusive and predatory behaviour, they're saying, stuff that he vehemently denies, saying that every relationship he has had has been uh, consensual. Now, today, the Times newspaper are reporting that since their story was published over the weekend, more women have come forwards with fresh allegations uh, of sexual abuse uh, from Russell Brand. These are claims, they say, that are yet to be investigated. Now, the Met Police are say that they're looking into the matter and are urging alleged victims to come forwards. We have got a statement from them here, they have said that we are aware of media reporting of a series of allegations of sexual assault at this time. We have not received any reports in relation to this. If anyone believes they have been the victim of a sexual assault, no matter how long ago it happened, we would encourage them to contact the police. Now, uh, Brand's former employers, Channel 4 uh, and the BBC, have uh, since also uh, released some statements. So Channel 4 have said that they are currently undergoing an internal investigation. The BBC have said the following. The documentary and associated reports contained serious allegations spanning a number of years. Russell Brand worked on BBC radio programmes between 2006 and 2008, and we are urgently looking into the issues raised. Now, uh, over the weekend, there have been some fast developments. Brands, uh, literary agent Tavistock would have uh, cut all professional ties uh, with the former actor, a domestic abuse charity that he worked with, have also done the same. Now, in the meantime, serious questions are being asked of uh, these big stations of the likes of Channel 4 and BBC and various production companies that he worked with, just how much uh, were they aware of the conversations that were having or happening 
behind the scenes? Were there uh, matters that were raised to, to HR? And if there were, uh, what was done about them? So the next few days with these investigations that are uh, currently ongoing will be uh, very telling indeed. OK, Sarah, thank you very much. Well, at 8.30 this morning, we're going to discuss the allegations against Russell Brand with Caroline Noakes, Chair of the Women and Equalities Committee, so stay tuned for that. And these allegations dominate the newspapers again. The Times, which was involved in the joint investigation, says more women have come forward since the story broke on Saturday. While The Sun covers the urgent inquiry being launched at the BBC as police ask accusers to come forward. The Telegraph also focuses on the presenter's former employee, BBC, forced into urgent inquiry over brand. And the Mirror's headline, What Did TV Chiefs Know? The Metro asks the same question. Aid workers are scrambling to prevent another disaster in Libya, this time the spread of disease. A week on from the floods, more than 10,000 people are still missing in the port city of Derna, and there are concerns growing that the water supply has been contaminated. Our special correspondent Alex Crawford has this report. Help to devastated Derna has dramatically stepped up in the past 24 hours. It follows criticism from residents that it's taken too long to arrive and being chaotic and uncoordinated. Now Libyans are facing another crisis, the possible outbreak of disease. So they're handing out masks and there's frantic spraying of streets with disinfectant. There are potentially thousands of decomposing bodies still encased in mud or buried under rubble. The water is heavily contaminated and the risk of infection is high. So Libyans from all across their fractured country are trying to help. You try and describe everything, but you're lost for words. You're lost for words. Like, it's an absolute catastrophe. This is for our country, this is for our home. So we will do everything and everything and everything we can do. For our home. But the frenzied attempts to help have clogged up the main route into the city's gutted centre. But even with the increased activity and extra resources being thrown at this issue, this shows you just how big the problem is. This didn't exist before. It was a tiny trickle of a stream if there were lots of, of rain and showers. Now there's a massive big scar right through the town and all the buildings on either side have actually been flattened, taken away or left destroyed. The Libyan National Army, headed by the military strongman Khalifa Heftar and his sons, has been accused of using the disaster to exert further control over the east. His commandos were anxious to show us their efforts to help after being widely condemned for focusing on bolstering their power here rather than distributing humanitarian aid. The youngest Heftar son could be the next man in charge here. He's happy for us to film him shaking hands with soldiers from the West. The two opposing armies control opposite sides of the country and have fought a protracted civil war. General Saddam Heftar is head of the Disaster Response Committee, in charge of organizing international aid teams, many of whom have told us of the struggle to get access, but he was reluctant to talk about his role. I see lots of people who need help for electricity, water, aid, everything. Has there been a big enough international response, or you just don't want the international response? <laughs> Everything's fine for now, he tells us. Everybody's searching now and we're ready for help. But he's a man with a reputation for toughness and doesn't seem to want to answer much more. There's a lot of uh, criticism that it could have been prevented by the Libyan authorities. What's your view on that? But he gives that short shrift. All is OK, he says. I have no criticism. His key role in East Libya means he and his family are also in charge of the aid distribution and any inquiry into what went wrong. Right now, the Hefta-controlled troops are on a charm offensive with us. They want to hammer home their dedication to the people of East Libya and how they're trying to find and retrieve the victims of this huge disaster.
We're here and helping retrieve the dead bodies. May Allah help us and may Allah help Libya. All of us are brothers and the guys are here and we're ready to give everything, even if that costs us our lives. The Derna coastline is thick with debris, so much so you can walk on the water. It's littered with the battered remnants of barely recognizable vehicles. Terrified families had been racing to drive their way out of the torrent, but their shattered cars show they stood little chance in the face of such force. And divers are still one week on finding hundreds of bodies trapped beneath. And fear there are still many more. Alex Crawford, Sky News, Derna. Well, let's talk now to our Africa correspondent, Yusra El Bagir, who joins us live from Derna. And Yusra, now the big concern is how they prevent disease spreading. What are they doing there? They're, they're giving out masks. They're taking the initiative to kind of warn people. There's a lot of antibacterial uh, liquid being handed out. People are trying to be mindful wearing, wearing, you know, technical gear when they're dealing with bodies. Now more than a thousand bodies have been buried in mass graves up in the mountain, kind of further upstream from, from the dams. But th these mass graves do represent to people that chance that they didn't get to bury their loved ones. Those that were lucky were able to have a body identified and be told that their loved ones were found and confirmed dead. But the majority, the majority of people here have just assumed that their, their missing loved ones are now dead after the 72 hour window passed. And I think we've done a lot of work to understand the technicalities of this disaster, how the dams failed, how this could happen. But really to, to, to know the true scale is to speak to people here and, and know that surviving comes at a massive cost. There are families, one down the road lost 55 members in one family. There are funerals all over the city. And one child who survived miraculously, an 11-year-old who was swept away to sea and then washed back up to the shore with just a few scratches has lost his entire family. And we we've, we've really feel like that was just devastating for him, even though it's a miracle. So people have to kind of adjust and deal with something so, so visceral and so violent after surviving years of political violence. Yusra, thank you very much. Well, if you scan the QR code on your screen right now, you can listen to our latest Sky News Daily podcast. Neil Patterson talks with both Sky News Africa correspondent there, Yusra el Bagir, and special correspondent Alex Crawford, who offer eyewitness accounts from Derna, which, of course, was devastated when these two dams collapsed, collapsed watching much of the city into the Mediterranean. You can listen and subscribe to the Sky News Daily wherever you get your podcasts. Ukrainian forces say they've recaptured the front-line village of Klitschkiva near Bakhmut, which could be their significant gain in three days. The village lies on higher ground, which has been the scene of intense fighting for six weeks, around six miles south of Bakhmut in the east of the country. Bakhmut was captured in May. The village itself has been largely destroyed by heavy shelling. Ukrainian forces filmed themselves raising a blue and yellow flag over the ruins. They hailed the advance as a tactically significant staging post for further offensive actions. I would like to especially recognize the warriors who are gradually regaining Ukraine's territory in the area of Bakhmut. The 80th Air Assault Brigade, the 5th Separate Assault Brigade and Fury Joint Assault Brigade of the National Police. Klishivka, well done. And the Canadian Defence Minister, Bill Blair, will be here soon to talk about how his country's troops are in the UK helping to train Ukrainian soldiers. Well, let's take a look at some of the day's other headlines now. And NHS leaders have warned that historic joint strikes by junior doctors and consultants this week will bring the worst disruption yet. Consultants in England will walk out for 48 hours from Tuesday and will be joined by their colleagues on Wednesday. Thousands of appointments are to be cancelled or pushed back. Exeter Airport has reopened this morning after torrential rain flooded the terminal. Thunderstorms also caused disruption on roads in southern England. The worst of the weather appears to be over for now, but there is a stormy week ahead. A lorry driver has been jailed after police in Essex seized £70,000 in cash disguised as sandwiches. Marius Rugsinski was arrested after the money, wrapped in tinfoil, was discovered in the cab of his vehicle. 
The 28-year-old was sentenced to 20 weeks in prison after pleading guilty. Now, the Labour Party has called for Rishi Sunak to block Liz Truss's resignation on his list, saying people should not be rewarded for crashing the economy. Ms Truss will give a speech this morning in which she's expected to defend the record of her short-lived administration and urge Rishi Sunak to cut taxes. We're joining me now is our political correspondent, Mari Aurora. Um, so, Mari, uh, lots to talk about today with the politicians that we've got coming in, HS2 and, of course, Liz Truss. Absolutely, yes. So the former Prime Minister, Liz Truss, remember her, she is giving a big speech uh, in London today with an, a think tank called the Institute for Government. And that's at about 10am this morning. And she's essentially going to be trying to kind of defend her position as PM, saying that she was going for growth and she's trying to defend some of the criticisms around the fact that she was criticised for seeking uh, to be fiscally irresponsible and seeking unfunded tax cuts. She has an issue with the character characterization of that. So uh, she's going to be kind of calling on, uh, you know, Rishi Sunak to be thinking about tax cuts, thinking about shrinking the welfare spend. Also, she wants him to embrace free market ideologies. She wants him to maybe step back a little bit on green commitments uh, in terms of what the pressure is for the taxpayer, potentially also raising uh, the retirement age. She's got all these kind of calls. And she's also going to be talking, once again, we hear it over and over again from Liz Truss, that the kind of political and economic establishment, the markets, were the reason for her demise. So it's her way of kind of almost trying to uh, pick up the remnants of her reputation and stick them all back together. We'll see how uh, successful she is on that. Now, the Lib Dems have said that this is comparable to an arsonist giving a talk on fire safety. The Labour Party are calling on Rishi Sunak to block her resignations on his list in the first place. But also behind the scenes, if you talk to some Tory MPs, it might surprise you, but actually some Tory MPs still believe she was right. They might not agree with the way she did it, but they actually believe her ideology was right. And if you look at the mortgage rates we are seeing at the moment, they are, in fact, about the same, if not a little bit higher, than they were after her mini-budget. So some would say maybe she was right all along. Uh, obviously, the establishment, as she calls it, definitely does not agree. So that's what we're expecting from Liz Truss uh, this morning. And uh, Mr Carney has been responding to her ideology and her arguments, criticising what she was trying to create, which was uh, Singapore on Thames, and he doesn't really believe that was the case. When Brexiteers tried to create Singapore on the Thames, the Truss government instead delivered Argentina on the Channel. Well, I'm joined in the studio by the Conservative MP, Laura Trott. Uh, very good to see you today. Thanks very much uh, for joining us. Um, sh should we start, I suppose, with, with what people... I was probably hoping to come more to the end of our interview with, talking a little bit about Liz Truss and, and the economic in impact of what she's saying. How do you reflect on the fact that she's speak speaking today and the kind of things she's going to say about Rishi Sunak and the fact that he spent far too much money in her mind? Well, I think Liz Truss has admitted herself that mistakes were made last year. And I think what is really important is that the Prime Minister was very clear, you know, in the Conservative leadership contest last year, that obviously we must do supply-side reform, it's really important, but, you know, above all, we must be focused on fiscal stability. And that's what he has done since he's been in power. He has restored fiscal stability to this country. He's focused on bringing inflation round, down, growing the economy and cutting the debt. Liz Truss says she would have saved £35 billion if she'd been... Prime Minister, do you think that those sums add up? Uh, no, I don't. OK, that's a pretty straightforward <laughs> answer. The Lib Dems have said it's a bit like an arsonist giving a talk about fire safety. I think, as I said, she admitted mistakes were made. I think it's important that we focus on what we're doing at the moment, though. And that is making sure that monetary and fiscal policy work together. So we're making sure that the government is doing all it can to bring inflation down to support the Bank of England. And that is starting to work. You know, it's still too high at the moment, but it is really coming down. That's really important because that is the biggest pressure facing every family in the United Kingdom at the moment. And bringing inflation down is the best tax, tax cut that we can give any family. The other thing that this government's also doing, though, of course, is going through with her resignation honours list. Uh, there's a number of people on there. Labour are calling for Rishi Sunak to block this because they say someone who's been in the job for such a short length of time shouldn't be allowed to have an honours list. What, what do you think? Uh, that's not a matter for me. That's a matter for kind of the household lords and the processes that mm. go through with that. But you must think, I mean, you're speaking here on behalf of the government. I mean, 
does the honours system need revamping? There was, of course, enormous concern about Boris Johnson's massive list that he put in after he left Prime Minister. Just, does this government accept that maybe now is the time to relook at this system? That's not what I'm focused on as Pensions Minister at the moment. What I'm focused on at the moment is ensuring that people have a decent retirement income, you know, some changes that we're talking about today, which is trying to boost people's private pensions. Uh, that's what I think uh, I should be kind of talking about today, and that's absolutely what I'm focused on. And, and we will come to pensions, but it just, I mean, I'm just thinking, you know, as you, as you campaign at the next election, when you're on the doorstep talking to people, it's something that, that people are concerned about, and people will be asking you, you know, why are you allowing these prime ministers who messed up the country to then award their friends. Look, I get that people have concerns about it, but I would definitely argue that the overwhelming concern of people at the moment is about cost of living, it is about inflation, and that is the primary focus of this government. You are announcing uh, today um, about pensions. I mean, of course, Liz Truss's actions led to fears for the bond markets, which has affected many people's pensions. You're talking about a private member's bill on auto-enrolment, which is expected to clear its final hurdle in the House of Lords. Why is this bill important? So when people talk about pensions, quite often they talk about the state pension, but actually people's private pensions are incredibly important. And we bought something in in 2012 called automatic enrolment, which means that when you work, automatically a bit of your money goes towards your pension and crucially a bit of your employer's money goes towards your pension as well. The changes we're bringing forward, which is something that have been called for for a long period of time uh, and have been backed by a private member's bill by Jonathan Gullis and Baroness Rob or uh, Rouse Altman, mean that there'll be more money going into your pension from you, but also from your employer. It means you're paying into your pension from the first pound that you earn and that you'll start paying earlier from when you're around 18. But there'll be people who are on the lowest levels of earning um, who you want to auto-enrol, uh, who may not be able to afford the cut to their pay packet if they do this. They can't afford to live now on what they've got. So what we've seen at the moment is that actually very low rates of people uh, withdrawing from automatic enrolment. And, you know, we've obviously put a lot of support in place for people at the moment, the cost of living support, the cost of living um, payments for the lowest paid. Um, but also we're going to phase this in over time. We know it's really important it's done gradually uh, and that the effect on people's income is very small and over a long period. So we've absolutely taken that into account. But aren't you sending a message to people that they can't rely on the state pension? Is that what you're hoping to do? No, not at all. The state pension is always going to be the bedrock of people's support in retirement. But we know to get the retirement that people want, people will want their own private pensions as well. And we're making sure that they've got that in place and also that every single penny that they put into their pension is working really, really hard for them. Um, we're expecting an announcement this week on, on HS2. Can you tell us, is it going to end at Euston or at Old Oak Common? Well, look, as you would expect, the government looks at every single penny that it's spending to making sure that we're getting value for money. Uh, I, I don't want to preempt any of that, but it's obviously clear that there are spades in the ground on HS2 at the moment, uh, and, that is, and that is delivering and work is underway. Mm. But, I mean, in terms of it being a waste of money, it's been a colossal waste of money, hasn't it? If, it's been, if we spent £100 billion and it's, it's actually a railway that doesn't bring people into the heart of London. Well, look, there are clear benefits to the project. It's been a long-term project. But as I said, this is something which, uh, you know, the government constantly keeps everything it spends under review. But the whole point of it was to level up the north and to do a fast connection between London and the north. We know that it's not going to be going as far into the north as we expected. And it now looks like potentially it may not be even coming into London either. I mean, I think the government's done a huge amount on le levelling up over the course of this parliament. You know, you put millions and millions of pounds into regeneration projects. That's been incredibly important. You know, we've had things like restoring your railways, bringing railway lines back in uh, to use for the first time. So there is a huge amount going on. This but is this part this is, policy, of policy, and it's part and of it that. costs and it, the most. And it is delivering, right? You know, we are talking about it going to uh, Birmingham, but. As I said, I, I, I'm not the transport minister. I can't preempt what is is going to um, happen, but it's right that the government looks at every single penny that's being spent. Okay, Laura Trott, Parliamentary Under Secretary, Department for Work and Pensions. Thank you. Thank you. Right, let's get a look at the weather now, and it's been pretty hairy out there overnight. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, after the recent thunderstorms and localised flooding in the south, this week looks more autumnal with spells of wind and rain. A warm start for many, especially in the muggy south, where there have been some thundery downpours. 
Rain moving across Britain this morning will turn showery in the south, allowing early thunderstorms in the southeast to clear away. A mix of sunshine and showers over Ireland and Northern Ireland will follow to most other places, but northeast Scotland will stay cloudy and wet, cooler and fresher from the west. The afternoon will bring further blustery showers with rain in the northeast. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Now, Exeter Airport is expected to reopen this morning after torrential rain flooded the terminal area. Thunderstorms also caused disruption on the roads in southern England. Well, our Sky meteorologist Kirsty McCabe is with me now. And Kirsty, it was, you know, some of mm. us in the, in the night were woken up by ferocious storms in, in the southeast, but real problems with flooding. Absolutely. I mean, I've had a few messages from friends this morning complaining about the thunderstorms waking them up overnight. But the main issue has been just the intensity of the rainfall. We've had more than a month's worth of rain falling, for example, in Exeter, than we'd have during the whole of September. So it fell in one day, really within a 12-hour period. We've seen 40 to 60 millimetres quite widely across parts of Devon, um, also parts of Somerset as well. And it all tied in with this very warm, humid air that moved north from France overnight. Uh, we've got these pulses of thunderstorms that have just been moving through all the... Um, through the early hours of Sunday morning, right through much of the day, and it's continued. It's still clearing now, in fact, across parts of Yorkshire, Lincolnshire. Eventually, by about 8 o'clock, most of that should have moved out into the North Sea, but it has meant for quite a period of time we've had these continuous storms rumbling up from the south, and because it's been quite muggy and quite warm in the south, there's been more energy available, which has meant these really deep convection, really quite vigorous thunderstorms. And um, the problem with um, such a large amount of rainfall in a small amount of time is that there's nowhere for the water to go. Mm. I do love the fact that your friends ring you up to complain about the weather. Like, <laughs> Always. <laughs> like you've got something you could do about it. Uh, Joe, thanks very much. Well, coming up on Sky News Breakfast, the Canadian Defence Minister Bill Blair will be here to talk shortly about how his country's troops are here in the UK helping to train Ukrainian soldiers. Plus, I'll ask Oxfam about their report, which claims we missed out on £23 billion that could have gone towards tackling the climate crisis. And why the dark circles new research about pandas could hold the answer. Five of us have made it out of the car. Welcome to Backstage, the film and TV podcast.
Welcome back to Sky News Breakfast. Our top stories this morning. The Times newspaper says they've been contacted by several women since publishing claims of rape, sexual assault and emotional abuse. About the comedian Russell Brand. The Labour Party has called for Rishi Sunak to block Liz Truss's resignation honours list, saying people should not be rewarded for crashing the economy. And Ukraine has captured more land near Bakhmut in the east. Well, let's get more on that story. Ukrainian forces say that they have recaptured the frontline village of Kaschivka, uh, which is near Bakhmut, which could be their second significant gain in three days. The village lies on higher ground, which has been the scene of intense fighting for weeks, around six miles south of Bakhmut in the east of the country. Bakhmut was captured by Russia in May. Well, the village itself has been largely destroyed by heavy shelling. The Ukrainian forces filmed themselves raising a blue and yellow flag over the ruins. They've hailed the advance as tactically significant staging post for further offensive actions. Well, Canada is contributing almost £20 million to a British-led partnership that's buying air defence equipment for Ukraine, and Canadian troops have been here helping train Ukrainian soldiers and had a visit from Canada's Minister of National Defence, Bill Blair, who's with me here in the studio. Hello. Um, so the troops that are here in, in the UK, what exactly are they doing? They're, they're going undertaking a very intense uh, training programme that's going to improve their effectiveness, but also their survivability in the, in the, in the, in the battle that Ukraine is facing with Russia. Um, actually, Canada has, over the past several years, trained almost 39,000 Ukrainian soldiers, and we work very closely in collaboration with the United Kingdom. Um, I had the opportunity yesterday to visit uh, LID, where both Canadian uh, Armed Forces members and the United Kingdom hey, Armed Forces members are, have been involved in the training. They, these are mostly civilians that have just been recruited in, in, into the, the Ukrainian Armed Forces. They, they come here to the UK. They, they undertake a very intense program. We saw some of their training yesterday. And, and yesterday, we also saw a cohort, a cohort of them who have recently graduated from that training program that are heading back and will be in the front lines in, in, in days and weeks. For those who aren't aware, of course, Canada has strong links to Ukraine. You have a really big Ukrainian diaspora even before this war. What extra funds have you been able to commit to the war effort there? Actually, Canada has been, I think, quite resolute in its support of Ukraine from the outset. And, and, and in, beginning in 2014, with, with the Russian aggression in the Donbass, we began to, to assist Ukraine in, in a number of different ways, including with the training of their armed forces. But since the beginning of this conflict, we have contributed almost $2 billion in, in military aid uh, to Ukraine, and we're continuing to find ways to, to support them, as well as other, like several billion dollars in other type, types of financial aid, because the needs of that country are quite significant. And we work very closely in collaboration. As a matter of fact, tomorrow, I'll be traveling to Ramstein, Germany, to meet with the Ukraine Defense Contract Group, which, of course, includes the United Kingdom. Uh, we'll be getting updates from U the Ukraines about the progress that they're making in, in their, their most recent counteroffensive, but also talking about some of the things that they need to continue in, in, in that fight. And, and we all work very collaboratively to make sure that they, they have the things that they need. How is the war being regarded back in Canada? I mean, these are obviously huge sums of money uh, and, and resources that Canada is putting into this war. It's, it's a long way away from Canada. Well, it is. And, and as you mentioned, there are, you know, there are almost 1.6 million Ukrainian Canadians in our country. And so we have a long and long-standing and very strong bond um, with, with Ukraine. But as well, we believe that this is also a battle to maintain the international rules order, the respect for the sovereignty of nations, um, we also believe that very much the Ukrainian people are on the front line of, of the defense of, of, of that international rules-based order, and, and we believe we have a, 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 a commitment, and we're unwavering in that commitment to continue to support them in that fight. And in terms of, of what we've seen overnight, it seems like progress is being made in some of the villages around Bakhmut. How, how do you think the Ukrainian counteroffensive is going? I think the Ukrainian counteroffensive has been really quite extraordinary, and, and, and I, I'm, I'm absolutely admiring of, of, of their resolve. And, and you know, the, the, they're in a very difficult fight, and I, and I think they've, they've, they've demonstrated to the world uh, the, the, their commitment in, in the defence of their country. And, and, I, and frankly, Canada and all of our coalitions and partners are very proud to stand with them and to support them in that fight. How long, though, do you think you can keep up the, this level of support? This isn't a war that's going to be over in the next couple of months, is no, it? No, ma'am. It, 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 it certainly is a, a, a difficult and, and, and challenging fight that the Ukrainians are in, but, but we are 
unwavering in our support. And, you know, I, 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 we, we would like to see this come to a peaceful resolution, but we will be there with Ukraine for as long as it takes. And, 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 and we're having conversations now with the Ukrainian government and with our coalition partners on, on how we can develop sustained models of funding so that, so that we can continue to make sure that we bring this to the proper resolution and, and protect that country. Are you worried that, 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 of course, some, you know, a lot of this aid and a lot of this help is also being contributed to by the US? If we see a change of government there, what impact this might have on, on Canadians out there and, and investment? I, I will say that we have, we have seen a remarkable uh, commitment from among all of our coalition partners, including, of course, the United States, that has made a very significant, important contributions. Um, and in all of our discussions with, with our counterparts around the world, uh, the, the, you know, I, I believe that that support is very strong and, and, and will continue to be. Um, there are always, you know, issues with respect to change of governments. And, and, but, but, uh, but I think, certainly in my country, that resolve, there's a consensus, I think, among most Canadians that this is, this is the right fight to support and that, and that what's, what is happening in Ukraine, uh, that Canada and all of our partners have a, have a responsibility here to be there for them. Uh, finally, you're also due to meet our, our new Defence Secretary, Grant Shapps, today, I think. Um, he's faced some criticism here in the UK for his lack of military experience when you compare him to his predecessor, Ben Wallace. What do you think of him so far? Well, I'm actually, actually I, I was very impressed with the, the, the defence policy update that, that pre the previous secretary uh, released a, a few months ago. And, and I, I think it's a, it's a strong model for us. So we can all learn from that. I'm really looking forward to working with Defence Secretary uh, Shapps. Um, our relationship with the United Kingdom has, there's 150 years of collaboration between Canada and the United Kingdom. It's, it's a proud and, 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 and honoured history that, that, that I, I hope that the, the Defence Secretary and I will be able to continue together. OK, Bill there, Canada's Minister for National Defence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. Italy is being promised help from the EU to deal with the migration crisis on the island of Lampedusa. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen visited yesterday after the arrival of more than 7,000 people in a week, which has doubled the island's population. Our international correspondent John Sparks is on Lampedusa for us. Uh, John, just an extraordinary number. This is an island which has, has seen migrants coming across by sea before, but, but in this number, at this scale, it's quite unprecedented. It is, Jane. That's absolutely right. I mean, there's only one thing that people in Italy are talking about as they take their morning cappuccinos, and that is Lampedusa. The situation in a community of, of 7,000 people dominating the time of the Italian Prime Minister and also many of the leaders of European Union states as well. This island located 60 miles from the coast of Tunisia, and thousands of migrants have made the crossing in the past week, disembarking on the dock behind me. But when the Prime Minister and the head of the EU Commission came to, to have a look, a fact-finding mission, well, most of the new arrivals had gone. After days of chaos on Lampedusa, a week where the community doubled in size, the road to the reception centre was empty. The facility, providing accommodation to migrants, was getting a clean, and the number of occupants had been substantially reduced. A visit by the Italian Prime Minister may have had something to do with it. Italy's pugnacious PM, Giorgia Maloney, arrived with the head of the European Commission. Giorgio, is this a problem you can actually solve? Can you I'm solve this problem? That. I'm working on that, said Maloney, who was joined by Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. They said it was important to see the situation on the island themselves. But what they were presented with at the centre and the port was an alternative reality. Previously, we saw hundreds of migrants standing on this dock. Now there were none. The contrast wasn't lost on local residents. Vanya told me, we're tired of politicians coming here, finding everything clean and orderly, and leaving. They make a thousand promises, and it starts over again. The Italians have the capability to process migrants on Lampedusa, the speedy cleanups, proof of that. But Giorgia Maloney says the responsibility must be shared. And the Commission president responded with a 10-point action plan. We have an obligation 
as part of the international community. But we will decide who comes to the European Union and under what circumstances, and not the smugglers and traffickers. The problem is the smugglers are servicing demand, and demand is huge. John, from Sierra Leone, reached the EU on his fourth attempt. Yes, I was in Morocco. I tried there twice. I never made it. So I, I tried to come back okay. to Tunis. Then I tried it once. Then I make it. Right. So you, you've spent a lot of money. Yes, I spent a lot of your... money. Through a lot, a lot of money, a lot of money. This island now symbolizes Europe's migration crisis. And new action plans and strategies are unlikely to fix it. You know, Jane, uh, the Italian papers this morning quoting uh, residents from Lampedusa saying that the cleanup has been so effective here that Lampedusa now looks like Switzerland. I'm not sure about that, but it does say that the Italians have the means, they have the capability to process migrants on Lampedusa. But there is a debate within the country and the EU. Uh, that debate is, is really about responsibility, it's about cost, it's also about tactics as well, with Georgia Maloney advocating a naval blockade of the North African coast, essentially pushing back the migrants. But there would be consequences in, in terms of the death toll. It's already dangerous, that would make it far more dangerous. But it is a political imperative, I think, for her to get the numbers of migrants down. Her political future probably depends on it. John. Thanks a lot. Sexual abuse survivors and their families have joined child safety experts in calling on big tech companies to ensure their platforms are safer for youngsters. They've highlighted security features like end-to-end -end encryption and messaging services, which they fear offenders are hiding behind as they target children. Shinki Mariki reports. At this time, he was asking for pictures of me, and then those requests started to get more and more explicit. When Frida began chatting to an older man online, she was 13 and had no idea that conversation would turn into half a decade of abuse. She was coerced into sending hundreds of images and videos. It was a really long, difficult time in my life, but unfortunately I spent so much of that time talking to someone who I didn't realise at the time, but really was harming me. Harm she feels was further enabled by the software he hid behind. I extensively deleted the conversations that we were having and tried to get rid of all trace of them. And it means that I don't have access to those conversations, those images right now. The only person who does is him, because it was on an encrypted platform. That is why, along with a global group of abuse survivors and experts, Frida has written a letter to tech companies, in which she says this. In the year since my experience of abuse took place, I have been waiting waiting for the moment when those who have control over digital products work with the people harmed by their products. I implore you to work with those affected adversely by the decisions you make and to champion the rights and safety of the users who you have failed to champion now and in the past. For myself and millions of other young people at risk of sexual violence online, the right to express ourselves online does not come with the right to be safe. Experts hope the bill this week is just the start. They want government to keep up the pressure as technology develops. So I'd say it's definitely key that government does continue to play a role in making sure that internationally there is a strong um, will to regulate these companies and to hold them account for what are simple design choices. For Frida and others like her, this isn't just policy, but a process. I think to really secure an effective long-term future for the bill, we really need to start thinking about how survivors can be involved throughout. A process that needs to keep the victims of online harms at its heart. Shingi Marike, Sky News. Now, research out this morning could help us understand the sleepy nature of pandas. The study from the University of Stirling suggests that bears suffer jet lag, just like we do, in zoos that are located further north than where they usually live. Now, scientists want to look at whether pandas' moods and motivation are impacted by seasonal affective disorder. They just need to get to bed earlier, don't they? After the break, Oxfam will explain how it thinks the biggest and richest polluters should be paying more to help us deal with our changing climate. 
just over a year since we've said goodbye to Neighbours, it's relaunching again today. We'll hear what some of the stars think about the comeback. I've had an eating disorder of some form for nearly 20 years. I was first diagnosed with anorexia when I was 15. And I wanted help and I asked for help. And I was met with this system that was just really resistant to treating me and to giving me any help. And I look at this guidance and I look back to when I was in my teens and think, gosh, I would have been perhaps eligible for this. And certainly if I'd have known about it, I might have actually asked for it because I was so unwell. Everybody I saw was telling me there's nothing we can really do. I was not actually treated for the anorexia for more than six years. And they said I was too unwell, that I didn't want to be treated, that I was resistant to getting better. And I felt like I was really blamed for what were the problems of the system. It was the system not treating me. And I think this, this is a cultural problem in the way that we treat eating disorders that it's a very negative experience for many people in, in their treatment where they aren't inspired by the prospect of reliable treatment for as long as they need it. And I think it does feed into that despair that I certainly felt when I thought that there was no help available and I'm not going to get better. And I was told actually from quite a young age that this is something you'll live with for the rest of your life. And actually there is no evidence for that. We really need to get rid of this culture that says that patients are not treatable because actually it's the system that isn't able to treat them at the moment. I think that it's premature to say that this is about the illness, it, it just leads to death, unfortunately people will die, when actually the part we should think about is, are we giving enough care in the first place? And I had care more than six years after I was treated and I'd been told that whole time that I couldn't get better and I was denied that care. And it makes me very angry and also really actually very sad that what I was experiencing was preventable because in my case, I did get better with the right support and I am vastly different from how I was then because I did have that treatment. But if I'd have been offered it, like I said, I think I might have, you know, in that depth of despair, I might have asked for it and I would not have had the life that I've had since. And it's not been easy, it's not perfect and I'm not fully recovered, but I am vastly different from, from how I was. And that is a, a sign of hope and we really need to be thinking about that as well and inspiring that with the appropriate support. Oxfam says the government would have had an extra £23 billion to fight and manage climate change this year if the UK's worst polluters were taxed more. Well, Oxfam's Chief Impact Officer Alima Shivji is here in the studio with us. And, and Alima, you're saying that this is a bold solution to the climate crisis. Just talk us through your plan. Absolutely. So thanks, Jane, for having me here. Um, what we've seen is that, and the UK's own climate change committee is telling us this, the UK is not on track to reach its net zero targets by 2050. These are legally binding targets. So we need some really bold solutions. What we've looked at is what are the biggest levers the UK government can make to unlock huge sums of money. We're looking at 23 billion just in 2022 alone, um, had they used our suggestions, while making sure that these um, recommendations don't touch, don't hit general UK population. So we don't believe the UK public should pay. Um, what we're proposing is that the biggest polluters should pay. So that's fossil fuel companies and the extreme wealthy. But isn't that essentially, the, this announcement, the same as, as Labour's windfall tax on energy companies? So I think there's a, ho there's a whole bunch of different measures that need to be taken. The, the windfall tax that we have right now in place is a temporary measure, um, and it also has a perverse incentive to invest in oil and gas um, to get a tax break. So what we're proposing in terms of the windfall tax is a permanent windfall tax, um, and something that really focuses on all excess profits and doesn't have any tax breaks in it. So if, if companies coming here to the UK to, to, to invest are told that they can't make excess profits, why on earth won't those energy companies go and, and set their, their drilling and then set their companies in other parts of Europe instead and, and the UK lose jobs and infrastructure? 
So I think there's two parts of it. First of all, we're not touching normal profits. So we, you know, we're not saying companies shouldn't make profit and pay their shareholders. What we're saying is that in a period of excess profit, so you're looking at you know, more than 10% than what's expected, so sort of the windfall piece, that there would be a higher tax rate. So it's not that they wouldn't get anything out of that. It's just but that it's they'd just be taxed incentive, isn't it? And that's the, that's the issue. If you discourage companies from coming here, that will have an impact on, on British jobs and, and affect more hardworking people. I think what we're trying to, well, what we're also trying to say is that it, but we need this, so part of this is pushing for public subsidies to move. So right now, public subsidies into um, fossil fuel companies are really incentivizing fossil fuel production. What we want to do is redirect that towards renewables. So it's not, there would still be energy production, it would be a different form of energy production that is much more renewable, much greener, better for communities, better for planet. Um, so there'd still be incentives, there'd still be jobs, and everything we're proposing is really making sure that the UK public um, doesn't have a negative impact. The government, of course, argues that by allowing these, these companies to make money here, that that money is reinvested in, in the infrastructure and in, and in green technology. So are you not worried that if you disincentivise companies from coming here and from making that money, that they won't then invest in, in the green energy and in, in the future renewables that we need? So I think what we're saying is that they, they should come here and they should invest, but they should invest directly in renewables and the government should be in incentivising that, um, both by removing pub public subsidy from fossil fuel projects, redirecting that to green energy, as well as um, really tackling excess profit on fossil fuels specifically. Do you think the government is going to meet its net zero target by 2050? Only if it takes some bold moves. And the ones that we're proposing, they're not the only ones in, in the basket, there's a whole bunch, um, but the four that we're proposing uh, have the least amount on the UK public, but they also have the biggest public support, cross-party support for them. And the money that, that you're hoping you would be able to raise by doing this, what would you like to see it invested into? So we see it invested in two different ways. One is to tackling the climate, cl climate crisis here in the UK. So, for example, investing in renewable energy, as I've said, but also investing, for example, in um, making homes more energy efficient. So if you take the 23 billion the UK government could have raised last year, just half of that, about 11.7 billion, according to New Economics Foundation, could get 7 million homes energy efficient by 2025. What we'd encourage is the other half of that, or the other part of it, is used to um, tackle the UK government's own international climate commitments. Um, the UK government is committed to £11.6 billion pounds, um, to tackle international climate finance targets by 2026 and needs to, needs to find the money from somewhere. And what we're proposing is a solution. We've been asking lots of questions to the Labour Party over the last few weeks about the environment, something that they slightly feel like they're rowing backwards on their environmental commitments. Would that concern you if, you've got, if we've got a Labour government in the next time? I think for us, it's looking at all, all political parties. At the moment, we're not seeing bold solutions coming from anywhere. So we would encourage the government and all political parties to really think boldly. We need to build a future that we can live in, and importantly, a future that um, future generations can live and thrive in. Alima Shivji, Oxfam's Chief Impact Officer. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, with parts of the world experiencing extreme weather conditions, let's take a look at the impact of climate change on the planet. Uh, and the right half of the screen shows how the UK's power is currently being produced. On the top left, you can see how much warmer the Earth is now than it was in 1880. That's when modern record keeping began. Uh, and finally, bottom left, the total amount of CO2 emissions in the millions of tonnes. Now, the familiar faces of Ramsey Street, Erinsborough will return to our screens today. Neighbours has been revived by the streaming platform Amazon after what was supposed to be its grand finale last summer. The soap was deemed financially unviable by its Australian producers when Channel 5 dropped it here in the UK. Alan Fletcher, who returns to the show as Dr Carl Kennedy, admits he had nerves about the comeback. I, I've been talking to everyone about the fact that for me it was actually I was quite nervous going back because you know neighbors was kind of like wearing old clothes for, for, for most of us we're a very familiar work environment you go to work you knew everybody we're very relaxed and we had a great time making our TV show coming back the stakes are suddenly way up here because the show has been saved and we really need to do, pay homage to that. We need to make sure that we're doing the very finest work we can. Takes me back. Right, let's get a look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. 
the weather. Sponsored by Qatar Airways. After the recent thunderstorms and localised flooding in the south, this week looks more autumnal with spells of wind and rain. A warm start for many, especially in the muggy south where there have been some thundery downpours. Rain moving across Britain this morning will turn showery in the south, allowing early thunderstorms in the southeast to clear away. A mix of sunshine and showers over Ireland and Northern Ireland will follow to most other places. But the northeast of Scotland will stay cloudy and wet. It'll turn cooler and fresher from the west. The afternoon will bring further blustery showers with rain in the northeast becoming confined to Shetland. Showers will continue to affect the north and west overnight before more general rain moves in later. The wind will pick up too with coastal gales possible in the west. And then looking ahead to tomorrow, it looks rather cloudy with outbreaks of rain and they will be heavy and prolonged in parts of the north and it's going to stay windy there as well. And the unsettled conditions will continue through the week. We'll have further spells of wind and rain as well. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. You're watching Sky News. Coming up in the next hour of breakfast, the latest on the allegations against the Brussels brand, as the Times reports that it has heard from more women since it announced its expose.
Hello, good morning. It's 8 o'clock. The comedian Russell Brand is facing more allegations this morning about his treatment of women. It's Monday, the 18th of September. The Times say they've been contacted by several women since publishing claims of rape, sexual assault and emotional abuse. The BBC and Channel 4 have announced their own investigations into the former presenter who denies all the allegations against him. Also ahead, in Libya, aid teams scramble to prevent another disaster, the spread of disease. We are in Denna, where residents are still grappling with the shock of their loss. Raising the flag over liberated territory, Ukrainian forces claim a second significant gain in three days. Labour tells the Prime Minister to reject Liz Truss's honours list, calling it a reward for crashing the economy. And why pandas look so sleepy? New research finds they get jet lag. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. The Metropolitan Police has urged victims of sexual assault to come forward no matter how long ago it happened. The force issued the statement following allegations of sexual assault, rape and coercive behaviour against the comedian Russell Brand, which were published in the Sunday Times and Channel 4's dispatches. Well, the paper says that there are now, they are now investigating new allegations from more women who have contacted them. Mr Brand denies any wrongdoing, insisting that all of his relationships were consensual. Charlotte Griffiths was a journalist in her 20s when alleged offences took place in the early 2000s and met Russell Brand on the celebrity party circuit. It was a very hedonistic and wild, sort of chaotic time on the celebrity circuit, and it was before Instagram and Twitter, uh, so I think people were a bit less guarded. I think celebrities, you know, they basically got drunk behind the scenes or just behaved sort of badly behind the scenes, knowing they weren't going to get spl splattered all over social media. Well, Sky correspondent Zava Chowdhury joins me now. And, and Zava, this story's now been running for two days and still nobody has gone to the police. Good morning, Jane. So I'll start with a little bit of context. So it was over the weekend that uh, a joint investigation led by Channel 4, The Sunday Times and The Times newspaper reported that four women, one of which was 16 at the time, were alleging, they say, being sexually assaulted by the comedian Russell Brand during the height of his fame. So between 2006 to 2013. Now, some of these accusations include rape, uh, controlling behaviour, abusive behaviour uh, as well, they are saying. Now, Russell Brand is denying all of these claims. And he said in a video published on Friday last week that these are something that he denies. All his relationships have been uh, consensual. Now, today, the Times newspaper are reporting that since they published their story last week, more women have come forward with fresh allegations uh, of sexual abuse from Russell Brand. These are claims they say that are yet to be investigated. In the meantime, the Metropolitan Police have said that they are looking into the matter and they've released the following statement. We are aware of media reporting of a series of allegations of sexual assault. At this time, we have not received any reports in relation to this. If anyone believes they've been the victim of a sexual assault, no matter how long ago it happened, we would encourage them to contact police. Now, Russell Brand's former employers, Channel 4 and the BBC, have also said that they are currently conducting internal investigations. The BBC uh, have said the following, the documentary and associated reports contained serious allegations spanning a number of years. Russell Brand worked on BBC radio programmes between 2006 and 2008, and we urgently are looking into the issues raised. Now, since uh, the story broke, Brand's literary agent, Tavistock, would have dropped all professional ties, they say, uh, with the former actor. Similarly, a domestic abuse charity that he has previously worked with have also done the same. Now, in the next few days, there are 
big questions, particularly for those uh, companies that he worked for, so the likes of Channel 4, BBC, uh, and also uh, production companies, about whether TV bosses were uh, aware of the alleged behaviour from Russell Brand. If they were, were any issues raised to the HR departments uh, at these companies? And if so, what was done about them? So what comes out in the next few days will be uh, very telling indeed. OK, Sabah, thank you very much. Well, at 8.30, we're going to discuss the allegations against Russell Brand with the... with Caroline Noakes, of course, chair of the Women and Equalities Committee. And these allegations dominate the newspapers today. The Times, which was involved in that joint investigation, says more women have come forward since the story broke on Saturday. While The Sun covers the urgent inquiry being launched at the BBC as police ask accusers to come forward. The Telegraph also focuses on the presenter's former employer, BBC forced into urgent inquiry over brand. And The Mirror's headline, What Did TV Chiefs Know? The Metro asks the same question. Aid workers are scrambling to prevent another disaster in Libya, the spread of disease. A week on from the floods, more than 10,000 people are still missing in the port city of Derna, and there are growing concerns that the water supply has been contaminated. Our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, has this report. Help to devastated Derna has dramatically stepped up in the past 24 hours. It follows criticism from residents that it's taken too long to arrive and being chaotic and uncoordinated. Now Libyans are facing another crisis, the possible outbreak of disease. So they're handing out masks and there's frantic spraying of streets with disinfectant. There are potentially thousands of decomposing bodies still encased in mud or buried under rubble. The water is heavily contaminated and the risk of infection is high. So Libyans from all across their fractured country are trying to help. You try and describe everything, but you're lost for words. You're lost for words. Like, it's an absolute catastrophe. So this is for our country, this is for our home. So we will do everything and everything, and everything we can do we're all home. But the frenzied attempts to help have clogged up the main route into the city's gutted centre. But even with the increased activity and extra resources being thrown at this issue, this shows you just how big the problem is. This didn't exist before. It was a tiny trickle of a stream if there were lots of, of rain and showers. Now there's a massive big scar right through the town and all the buildings on either side have actually been flattened, taken away or left destroyed. The Libyan National Army, headed by the military strongman Khalifa Heftar and his sons, has been accused of using the disaster to exert further control over the east. His commandos were anxious to show us their efforts to help after being widely condemned for focusing on bolstering their power here rather than distributing humanitarian aid. The youngest Heftar son could be the next man in charge here. He's happy for us to film him shaking hands with soldiers from the West. The two opposing armies control opposite sides of the country and have fought a protracted civil war. General Saddam Heftar is head of the Disaster Response Committee, in charge of organizing international aid teams, many of whom have told us of the struggle to get access, but he was reluctant to talk about his role. I see lots of people who need help for electricity, water, aid, everything. Has there been a big enough international response, or you just don't want the international response? <laughs> Everything's fine for now, he tells us. Everybody's searching now and we're ready for help. But he's a man with a reputation for toughness and doesn't seem to want to answer much more. There's a lot of uh, criticism that it could have been prevented by the Libyan authorities. What's your view on that? But he gives that short shrift. All is OK, he says. I have no criticism. His key role in East Libya means he and his family are also in charge of the aid distribution and any inquiry into what went wrong. 
Right now, the Hefta-controlled troops are on a charm offensive with us. They want to hammer home their dedication to the people of East Libya and how they're trying to find and retrieve the victims of this huge disaster. We're here and helping retrieve the dead bodies. May Allah help us and may Allah help Libya. All of us are brothers and the guys are here and we're ready to give everything, even if that costs us our lives. The Derna coastline is thick with debris, so much so you can walk on the water. It's littered with the battered remnants of barely recognizable vehicles. Terrified families had been racing to drive their way out of the torrent, but their shattered cars show they stood little chance in the face of such force. And divers are still one week on finding hundreds of bodies trapped beneath. And fear there are still many more. Alex Crawford, Sky News, Derna. Well, a week on from those floods in Libya, more than 10,000 people are still missing around Derna, and aid workers are scrambling to prevent another disaster, this time the spread of disease. Our Africa correspondent Yusra El Bagir is in Derna for us. They're, they're giving out masks, they're taking the initiative to kind of warn people. There's a lot of antibacterial uh, liquid being handed out. People are trying to be mindful wearing, wearing you know, technical gear when they're dealing with bodies. Now more than a thousand bodies have been buried in mass graves up in the mountain, kind of further upstream from, from the dams. But th these mass graves do represent to people that chance that they didn't get to bury their loved ones. Those that were lucky were able to have a body identified and be told that their loved ones were found and confirmed dead. But the majority, the majority of people here have just assumed that their, their missing loved ones are now dead after the 72 hour window passed. And I think we've done a lot of work to understand the technicalities of this disaster, how the dams failed, how this could happen. But really to, to, to know the true scale is to speak to people here and, and know that surviving comes at a massive cost. There are families, one down the road lost 55 members in one family, there are funerals all over the city. And one child who survived miraculously, an 11 year old who was swept away to sea and then washed back up to the shore with just a few scratches has lost his entire family and we've we really feel like that was just devastating for him even though it's a miracle so people have to kind of adjust and deal with something so so visceral and so violent after surviving years of political violence Well, from the situation in Libya to what's happening at home, and the Labour Party has called for Rishi Sunak to block Liz Truss's resignation on his list, saying people should not be rewarded for crashing the economy. Ms Truss will give a speech this morning in which he's expected to defend the record of a short-lived administration and urged Rishi Sunak to cut taxes. Well, joining me now is the Shadow Paymaster General, Jonathan Ashworth. Uh, good to see you this morning. So, so you want Rishi Sunak to block li Liz Truss's resignation on his list. I mean... Do you think anything will really come of this? Well, look, the key issue here is that it's 12 months now since that quite disastrous set of decisions the Conservative government took, which ran our economy off a cliff. It led to a run on pension funds. It means that homeowners are paying hundreds, if not thousands of pounds more on their mortgages. And at the same time, I think something like 300 billion has been wiped off the value of properties. So people's mortgages going up, rent going up, and the value of properties coming down because of decisions taken by the Conservative government 12 months ago. And now for Liz Truss to be out here today uh, saying, you know, it was a London dinner party circuit that blocked her, when people in Leicester, in Ashfield, in Bury, in Bolton and Bolsover are paying more for food, I think is just extraordinary. If Rishi Sunak had any backbone, he would block this Liz Truss list today because I don't think businesses, hard-working families paying so much more on their mortgage think that list should go ahead. In many ways, it's a kick in the teeth. But, I mean, we could all look back in history at, at, at politicians that we haven't liked or necessarily admired and say, well, why did they get to, to give honours? I mean, it doesn't... I mean, is this something, one, that the Prime Minister could actually realistically do anything about, given the conventions, and two, would Labour change if you came into power? Would well, you reform the honour system entirely? You hit the nail on the head. The conventions. Mm. It's just a convention. So uh, Rishi Sunak could intervene if he had any backbone, if he was strong enough. But he's pretty weak, as we know. He's weak Rishi, isn't he? Uh, inaction man, as he's well known uh, and has been branded because he never does anything. 
but he could intervene. But the key thing in the end is that... Inaction man versus inaction on the beach. Inaction man. I mean, he doesn't do anything. He can't, he can't get a grip of anything, can he? The, you know, he can't deal with the NHS. The boats are still coming. Prices in the shops are still uh, crippling for a lot of people. He really is an uh, inaction man. But the key thing is, 12 months ago, the Conservatives ran our economy off a cliff. They crashed the economy. And people are paying so much more, hundreds of pounds more on their mortgage as a consequence. And now for Liz Truss to be coming out saying she wants to give all these uh, awards and honours to her, to her cronies. And you know, get this, right? She's writing a book. Can you believe this? She's writing a book. You couldn't make this up, called 10 Years to Save the West after spending 49 days as Prime Minister trashing the economy. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Keir Starmer said at the weekend that politicians who, who use insults like the ones that you've just used don't have anything to say. Well, I'm not sure. I mean, my insults have always got, have always got wit and panache about them. So, <laughs> uh, no, no, the key point is I'm making is a policy, a policy objection to what the Conservatives have done to our economy because of what they did to mortgages, what they've done to hard-working families. We're really struggling at the moment. But on, on honours... Let's be clear, would Labour reform the honours list altogether? Yeah, they, would you they, get rid of it? I mean, you know, this system does need reform. Of course it needs reform. And by the way, you know, Labour, so Prime, La yes. Labour Prime Ministers didn't do these resignation honours. Gordon Brown and Tony Blair didn't do this. Right? And they were in government for a lot longer than the 49 days that Liz Truss was Prime Minister for. But just, just a clear yes from you, Labour would reform this system. Yeah, this system does need reform, yeah. OK. Um, we're expecting an announcement this week about the future of HS2. Um, would Labour commit to building HS2 all the way from London all the way to Manchester? Yeah, our, our position is that HS2 should be completed to Manchester and Leeds. Uh, there's all this speculation. The Tories are uh, hinting that they're not going to do that. Well, I, you know, I'm not going to you know, be drawn by them uh, flying kites, but it just it tells me again that when it comes to the, the Midlands and the north of England, that the Tory party aren't really interested in them. But Pat McFadden said yesterday that Labour would look at the cost. He didn't give it an equivocal, the same answer that you're giving today, which is that Labour would definitely build it. No, no, no. no what, what Pat is saying, quite rightly, by the way, is if there are changes in Jeremy Hunt's budget, then, oh, that means you have to look at that. You have to look at the financial position. But our so that's a, that you're no, 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 no. But well. that's, that's, that is just how, you know, that's how budgets work. The government announced a series of financial decisions and the opposition responds to them. But our commitment to extending HS2 to the Manchester and Leeds uh, is clear. And actually, we think the government, rather than trying to wiggle off this commitment, should give some clarity now to investors, to businesses, because this extension will boost the economy in the North and the Midlands. But if the government want to sort of, as I say, wriggle off that, again, I think that's clear evidence that this government, have, the Tory party, have given up on, nor on northern towns and cities. So would Labour go ahead with it, whatever the cost? Well, as always on these matters, we look at things when the government announced their financial position, and then once the government have announced their financial position in the budgets, and there could be more budgets before a general election, we'll outline our position in the manifesto. But... Today, we are pushing the government to give us clarity that they are going to honour the commitment that they made to northern towns and cities. But it looks like they're trying to wriggle off that commitment. But it's, it might sound to some viewers that you're trying to wriggle off it as well. You're saying you're going to wait for the government to make an announcement about money before you will absolutely unequivocally say that Labour would build it. Well, it's entirely... Look, we started this interview when I was uh, criticising the Conservatives for making irresponsible, unfunded... Uh, decisions last year in that disastrous mini budget. So that is why the Labour Party will always be fiscally disciplined. We have an iron, a iron disciplined approach to the fiscal position. So it's perfectly sensible that if governments change its positions or the fiscal, fiscal position changes, that we will study that carefully and respond. But today, we are very clear, the government should offer and should commit to extending that, uh, uh, that railway line. Uh, and, and clear up this confusion that they have created. Mm. Uh, Keir Starmer's been racking up the air miles recently. He's been talking to France and the EU. Are, are you confident that Labour can get a bespoke deal with the EU that won't involve a quota system, i.e. us having to take immigrants from the EU? Well, we're not joining, that, e we're not joining that EU quota system. And we have to have a new approach because the Conservatives have uh, lost order and lost control of our asylum system. In fact, they've essentially, Rishi Sunak has essentially allowed it to be outsourced to these criminal gangs. And one of the most prominent Conservatives, the vice chair of the Tory party, said, oh, the criminal gangs will always be with us, as if we should all just give up on them. No, 
We believe we should be going after these gangs. We should be treating them as terrorists. We want to cooperate with Europe on, on sharing of intelligence, on security matters. We need to be looking at things like particular court orders where their assets are frozen, like you would apply to suspected terrorists. None of that is happening under the Tories. They've been completely given up on these gangs. And we need a policy that, where people who've applied for asylum, if their asylum application is not valid, and they're from Albania or India, wherever it is, they should be returned. But at the moment, the Tory policy is to stick everybody in, a, in these hotels across the country, costing £2 billion, and do nothing. Just leave them there. That is not a realistic and sensible way to deal with this problem. That is giving the green light to these terror, um, uh, criminal gangs smuggling people across the channel. We want to go after these gangs. But why does the Labour Party think Europe would be, be willing to help with all of those things that you want help with if we're not, in turn, willing to take some of their numbers from them? Because we want to cooperate on the security front in a way in which isn't happening at the moment. You know, there isn't that level of cooperation with the security services and the police services uh, uh, to really go after these gangs in a targeted way. And that's what we want to do. And that's something the government isn't doing. Jonathan Ashworth, Shadow Payne Master General, thanks Thank for coming in. Well, it's not just the Labour Party who are perhaps predictably scathing about Liz Truss and her record in office. The former Bank of England governor, Mark Carney, accused her of turning Britain into Argentina. When Brexiteers tried to create Singapore on the Thames, the Truss government instead delivered Argentina on the channel. Well, Mari is here in the studio. And Mari, you know, some might say, is it a bit early for Liz Truss to be making these kind of speeches? Well, a lot of people would say, should she ever be making these kinds of speeches? Some people have said she's trashed her own record when it comes to the economy and therefore she doesn't necessarily have the right to be speaking on this. But Liz Truss is powering through. She's trying to fight back and show that actually she still needs to be listened to and she's adamant that her arguments are still valid when it comes to growing the economy uh, here in the UK. So, I mean, interestingly, when you talk to Laura Trott, the uh, DWP, Work and Pensions Minister, she was very adamant that uh, Liz Truss was wrong uh, and that she could not have made those £35 billion set pound savings that you asked her about. And that was actually quite refreshing for once, to just have a government minister just to say, no, it's not true. Um, which we, we don't we all, get it. We always no, never get it, do we, Jane? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that was quite refreshing. But what was really interesting was actually the, the language between Jonathan Ashworth and Laura Trott is somewhat similar. So Laura Trott used this phrase, fiscal stability. Jonathan Ashworth used the, uh, Ashworth used the phrase, we need to be fiscally disciplined. Very, very similar phrases, and that's really indicative of the fact that both parties are trying desperately to prove that they can be trusted when it comes to the economy, when it comes to the money, and when it comes to government spending and not getting too carried away, especially when inflation is still so persistently high. Also, I mean, Labour really not committing when it comes to... Uh, HS2, we still don't know for sure, for sure, for sure. Jonathan Ashworth did say they are committed to HS2, but he did say nonetheless that depending on what happens in the autumn statement from Jeremy Hunt, maybe that uh, could change. So there's still no 100% guarantees when it comes to HS2. It was interesting he talked about uh, the immigration system and you did push him on that. And he and Keir Starmer, both on Sky News today and yesterday, have both been quite adamant that actually they are not going to be entering that, uh, that kind of... Uh, a quota deal with the EU when it comes to immigration. But the real question is, will the EU want to give us a bespoke deal? And we still don't really know the answer to that, because we can ask for things, but that doesn't mean we're necessarily going to get them. Uh, and his focus was very much cooperating when it comes to security. So I think there are still some questions around HS2. Potentially, maybe we can get an answer uh, this week. But also, I think there are still some questions to be asked around uh, the Labour Party's uh, policy when it comes to immigration. Okay, Mari, thanks very much. Now, Ukrainian forces say they've recaptured a frontline village near Bakhmut, which would be their second significant gain in three days. The village lies on higher ground, which has been the scene of intense fighting for weeks. It's around six miles south of Bakhmut in the east of the country. Bakhmut was captured by Russia in May. Well, the village itself has been largely destroyed by heavy shelling. Ukrainian forces filmed themselves raising a blue and yellow flag over the ruins. They hailed the advance as a tactically significant staging post for further offensive actions. I would like to especially recognize the warriors who are gradually regaining Ukraine's territory in the area of Bakhmut. 
the 80th Air Assault Brigade, the 5th Separate Assault Brigade and Fury Joint Assault Brigade of the National Police. Klishivka, well done. Let's take a look at some of the day's other headlines now. And NHS leaders have warned that historic joint strikes by junior doctors and consultants this week will bring the worst disruption yet. Consultants in England will walk out for 48 hours from Tuesday and will be joined by their colleagues on Wednesday. Thousands of appointments are to be cancelled or pushed back. A lorry driver has been jailed after police in Essex seized £70,000 in cash disguised as sandwiches. Marius Raczynski was arrested after the money wrapped in tinfoil was discovered in the cab of the vehicle. The 28-year-old was sentenced to 20 weeks in prison after pleading guilty. Exeter Airport has reopened this morning after torrential rain flooded the terminal area. Thunderstorms also caused disruption on the roads in southern England. The worst of the weather appears to be over for now, but there's a stormy week ahead. Let's take a look at some of the details. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, after the recent thunderstorms and localised flooding in the south, this week looks more autumnal with spells of wind and rain. It's a warm start for many, especially in the monkey south, where there have been some thundery downpours. Rain moving across Britain this morning will turn showery in the south, allowing early thunderstorms in the southeast to clear away. A mix of sunshine and showers over Ireland and Northern Ireland will follow to most places, but northeast Scotland will stay cloudy and wet, cooler and fresher from the west. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. So why has it been so wet and stormy? Well, our Sky Meteorologist Kirsty McCabe is here with me on the sofa now. And, and Kirsty, what was it that, that, that changed, you know, the inside of, of Exeter Airport into what looked like a swimming pool? Uh, an awful lot of rain in a very short space of time. We had um, a lot of pulses of heavy thundery rain moving up from France yesterday. We can take a look. We can see on the rainfall radar where the rain came from. And it basically pulses of rain pushing up from France. And it's been quite humid and warm, so there's a lot more energy available, which meant the downpours were that much heavier. And if we just click on, you can see these are some of the rainfall totals we've had in some of the locations across parts of the southwest. And some of those fell in just a very short space of time, so widely 40 to 60 millimetres more in places. And when you get such a large amount of rainfall in a short space of time, there's nowhere for the water to go, so it does cause these problems. In Dawlish, for example, the river that flows through the town there burst its banks and caused flooding in the beachfront in Dawlish. So it's been quite a lot happening yesterday. Swindon's had an awful lot of problems as well, given the large amount of rainfall that's fallen there. So it's all tied in with this change we're seeing our weather. We've had an awful lot of heat in the south and then we've had the thunderstorms moving up from France. We've also got a cold front coming in from the west adding into the mix and just all that extra energy just means these really intense and heavy downpours. We're losing the heat and humidity now, but the week ahead it really is going to be a, a real taste of autumn. Such a change from what we had just last week with the hottest weather of the year. We're now turning to something much more unsettled for the week ahead. OK, Kirsty, thanks very much. Well, still to come on Sky News Breakfast, we will discuss the allegations against Russell Brand with Caroline Noakes, Chair of the Women and Equalities Committee. And a promise of EU help for Italy to deal with its Lampedusa migrant crisis, but will it be enough? And why the dark circles? New research about pandas could hold the answer.
five of us have made it out of the car. Welcome to Backstage, the film and TV podcast. Top stories on Sky News Breakfast this morning. The Times newspaper says that they've been contacted by several women since publishing claims of rape, sexual assault and emotional abuse against Russell Brand, which the comedian denies. Ukraine says it's captured another village near the eastern city of Bakhmut, which fell into Russian hands in May. And the Labour Party has called for Rishi Sunak to block Liz Truss's resignation on his list, saying that people should not be rewarded for crashing the economy. The Metropolitan Police has urged victims of sexual assault to come forward no matter how long ago it happened. The Times is reporting this morning that more women are coming forward to them after its joint investigation into sexual assault allegations against Russell Brand, which he denies. Well, let's talk now to Caroline Noakes. She's chair of the Women and Equalities Committee. Uh, what's your reaction, Caroline, to, to these allegations that have been made against Russell Brand? Well, I think very clearly there needs to be a criminal investigation. In order for that to happen, these poor victims need to be supported and encouraged and empowered to go to the police and uh, take them through a process that needs to be supportive of them. Over the course of the last 36 hours, we've seen far too much victim blaming and shaming of individuals who need to be supported at the current time and not criticised. So do you think that that is why perhaps these women feel more comfortable talking to journalists uh, and newspapers rather than the police? Well, I think there's a real anxiety about going to the police. Questions that still linger over the uh, appalling incidents at things like Charing Cross Police Station when there was very obvious misogyny in the Metropolitan Police. So victims are reluctant to speak out and they need to be supported through the process. It's why that there are uh, specialists now who are able to do that. But I think what we've seen over the course of the last two days is more victims coming forward. And there certainly is um, a sense of strength in numbers women who hadn't previously been brave enough to uh, to make allegations against a very powerful and influential individual are now feeling brave enough to do so. And to be frank, that's a good thing. But do you not have any concerns or discomfort about the fact that this is, in essence, a trial by the media, not the UK's judicial system? And, you know, there are a lot of people who are questioning whether it's right that these crimes, alleged crimes, have been reported openly without there being any actual criminal charges. Well, that's why I absolutely started this interview by saying that we needed these victims to come forward to the police. We need this to be investigated both sides of the Atlantic, both by the Metropolitan Police and in Los Angeles. We need there to be a proper process. And these are serious allegations. These are criminal allegations of rape, of sexual assault, an allegation that sounds incredibly like grooming. And there will have been witnesses to all of that. And unfortunately, powerful men and it usually is men, tend to be surrounded by a wall of silence, by people who protect them, or by people who are, quite frankly, scared to speak out themselves because their jobs are reliant on that individual. And what we have to see, I think, in this instance, is a proper criminal investigation. We need to get to the bottom of these allegations, and there needs to be a judicial process. Do you think that there are bigger questions too for the entertainment industry? Does that have a problem with protecting people who may be committing crimes? Well, look, I think um, misogyny, sexual harassment and abuse is still widespread in many sectors. The entertainment industry specifically frequently runs on freelance contracts, the self-employed, and certainly my committee at the moment is conducting an inquiry into misogyny in the music industry. And the single message that we have had from women artists, from production crew, from sound technicians, is that they're freelance. And therefore, they are reliant upon very powerful individuals for their next job. And that leads them to being too afraid to speak out, too afraid to be seen as the difficult one, because they're reliant on these individuals for their income.
And, and I think that's a huge problem for the entertainment sector generally. It's part of the problem as well, and I suppose looking at comedy here in particular and that kind of light entertainment industry, that it is, it's all fun, isn't it? It's, it's, a, it's a very different job to the kind of job where you, you go into an office, you sit at a desk and you work for, for nine hours or whatever. That sense of fun, that sense of we're breaking the mould a little bit, allows people to behave in ways that they just wouldn't behave in, in normal society and that that has been ignored and tolerated for far too long. Sexual abuse is never fun. And that's the stark reality and so-called comedians thinking that they can get away with sexually abusing either people who work for them or people who they've been in relationships with for fun. That's not entertainment, it's abuse. What do you think Parliament can do to further protect women and girls? Look, I think, as I said, my committee is currently midway through uh, an inquiry looking at misogyny in sport, misogyny in the music industry, and there clearly will have to be recommendations to the government as to how we can better protect, how we can uh, look after women and girls, how we can tackle the cultures of misogyny. But I know that the DCMS Select Committee has also summoned television bosses in front of them over previous incidents. I have no doubt that in due course they will be inviting both Channel 4, the BBC, and no doubt the production companies, because their hands are not clean in this. None of these organisations appear to have effective whistleblowing policies that enable and empower victims to report with confidence, knowing that their concerns, their complaints will be investigated. And I think, as the Foreign Secretary said yesterday, there are questions that need to be answered by the broadcasters. Um... But Russell Brand denies all, all of these charges against him and, and others have, have looked at, at, what, at the, what these allegations are and, and also pointed out that perhaps we're looking at, at his behaviour. A lot of it, the public behaviour, certainly, that, that we know happened, that we, that we saw on, on film, um, was 20 years ago and, and a great deal has changed in 20 years, hasn't it, in terms of how people behave or, or are allowed to behave, certainly at work and in society and in all sorts of environments. Do you think things are better now in the, in the broadcasting industry than they were 20 years ago? Or do you think they're just the same? I'd like to say that I thought that they were better, but uh, broadcasting and the media's uh, hands are not clean on this. And that's the stark reality, is that I am conscious that this could still very easily happen today. And to be quite frank, we can't try and whitewash this through the lens of history Russell Brand has uh, faced some serious allegations in the media and I think it's absolutely crucial that those are brought to the police, that a criminal investigation takes place and that we get to the bottom of them. Um, but I don't think we can excuse sexual harassment and sexual abuse just because it happened a long time ago. Caroline Noakes, Chair of the Women and Equalities Committee. Uh, very good to talk to you, thank you. And just to, to reiterate, we're covering this story that Russell Brand has denied all of these charges against him. The Metropolitan Police have urged anybody who may have been affected to come to them directly. The BBC has also said it is launching an investigation. Now, Italy is being promised help from the EU to deal with the migration crisis on the island of Lampedusa. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen visited yesterday after the arrival of more than 7,000 people in a week, doubling the island's population. Our international correspondent John Sparks is on Lampedusa. It's an enormous number of people to arrive in a very short period of time. How on earth did they manage to process them all so quickly, John? Well, I, I think they haven't, and that is why I am here. They've really struggled to do that, and I think that is why people all across Italy right now, as they take their coffee, their Cornetto this morning, they're talking about Lampedusa. That the situation in this, this community of 7,000 people really dominating the time of the, the Italian Prime Minister, Giorgia Maloney, uh, dominating the time of the, the leaders of the EU states as well. It's a really big deal. Tunisia, the coast of Tunisia, is located just 60 miles from where I am standing, and thousands, 11,000 actually, have made the crossing in the past week, disembarking on the dock just behind me. But when the Italian Prime Minister and the head of the EU Commission came to have a look, they came on a fact-finding mission, well, most of the new arrivals had gone. 
After days of chaos on Lampedusa, a week where the community doubled in size, the road to the reception centre was empty. The facility, providing accommodation to migrants, was getting a clean, and the number of occupants had been substantially reduced. A visit by the Italian Prime Minister may have had something to do with it. Italy's pugnacious PM, Giorgia Maloney, arrived with the head of the European Commission. Giorgio, is this a problem you can actually solve? Can you I'm solve this problem? I'm working on that, said Maloney, who was joined by Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. They said it was important to see the situation on the island themselves. But what they were presented with at the centre and the port was an alternative reality. Previously, we saw hundreds of migrants standing on this dock. Now there were none. The contrast wasn't lost on local residents. Vanya told me, we're tired of politicians coming here, finding everything clean and orderly, and leaving. They make a thousand promises, and it starts over again. The Italians have the capability to process migrants on Lampedusa, the speedy cleanups proof of that. But Giorgia Maloney says the responsibility must be shared. And the Commission president responded with a 10-point action plan. We have an obligation as part of the international community, but we will decide who comes to the European Union and under what circumstances, and not the smugglers and traffickers. Problem is, the smugglers are servicing demand, and demand is huge. John, from Sierra Leone, reached the EU on his fourth attempt. Yes, I was in Morocco. I tried there twice. I never made it. So I, I tried to come back okay. to Tunis. Then I tried it once, then I make it. Right. So you, you've spent a lot of money. Yes, I spent a lot of your... money. True. A lot, a lot of money, a lot of money. This island now symbolizes Europe's migration crisis. And new action plans and strategies are unlikely to fix it. You know, Jane, the Italian papers have been quoting residents here on Lampedusa saying that this cleanup has been so effective, their island now looks like Switzerland. I'm not sure about that, but I do think the cleanup shows that the Italians do have the means and the, the, the capability to, to police and to process migrants on this island. They can do it. But I think the debate here and in the EU is about responsibility. It's about cost and it's also about tactics. Uh, Georgia Maloney is advocating for a naval blockade. She wants to push the boats back towards North Africa. But there would be consequences there. It's already a dangerous journey for the migrants. That would make it far, far worse. But her political imperative is to bring down the numbers of migrants. That is absolutely essential for her. And I think her political career, her political future, probably depends on it. John, thanks very much. A research out this morning could help us understand the sleepy nature of pandas. The study from Scotland's University of Stirling suggests that the black and white bears suffer jet lag, just like us, when they're held in zoos that are located further north than they usually live. Now, scientists want to look at whether pandas' moods and motivations are impacted by seasonal affective disorder. Maybe they've just been on early shifts. Still to come on Sky News Breakfast, former Welsh national rugby player Alex Popham, who was diagnosed with dementia at the age of just 40, will tell us about his epic ride for awareness. Just over a year since we said goodbye to neighbours, it's relaunching again today. We'll hear what some of the stars think about the comeback. I've had an eating disorder of some form for nearly 20 years. I was first diagnosed with anorexia when I was 15. And I wanted help and I asked for help. And I was met with this system that was just really resistant to treating me and to giving me any help. And I look at this guidance and I look back to when I was in my teens 
and think, gosh, I would have been perhaps eligible for this. And certainly if I'd have known about it, I might have actually asked for it because I was so unwell. Everybody I saw was telling me there's nothing we can really do. I was not actually treated for the anorexia for more than six years. And they said I was too unwell, that I didn't want to be treated, that I was resistant to getting better. And I felt like I was really blamed for what were the problems of the system. It was the system not treating me. And I think this, this is a cultural problem in the way that we treat eating disorders, that it's a very negative experience for many people in, in their treatment where they aren't inspired by the prospect of reliable treatment for as long as they need it. And I think it does feed into that despair that I certainly felt when I thought that there was no help available and I'm not going to get better. And I was told actually from quite a young age that this is something you'll live with for the rest of your life. And actually there is no evidence for that. We really need to get rid of this culture that says that patients are not treatable because actually it's the system that isn't able to treat them at the moment. I think that it's premature to say that this is about the illness, it, it just leads to death, unfortunately people will die, when actually the part we should think about is, are we giving enough care in the first place? And I had care more than six years after I was treated and I'd been told that whole time that I couldn't get better and I was denied that care. And it makes me very angry and also really actually very sad that what I was experiencing was preventable because in my case, I did get better with the right support and I am vastly different from how I was then because I did have that treatment. But if I'd have been offered it, like I said, I think I might have, you know, in that depth of despair, I might have asked for it and I would not have had the life that I've had since. And it's not being easy, it's not perfect and I'm not fully recovered, but I am vastly different from, from how I was. And that is a, a sign of hope and we really need to be thinking about that as well and inspiring that with the appropriate support. Now, the Rugby World Cup is one of the biggest sporting events on the planet, it says here, you know, I don't know about football, uh, last night, but we saw one of the games of the tournament when Fiji beat Australia for the first time since 1954. But there are growing concerns about the impact of all those heavy collisions which make professional rugby such a spectacle. Alex Popham is a former Welsh international and was diagnosed with early onset dementia at just 40 and he joins me now. Uh, Alex, lovely to talk to you, former Welsh national rugby player, of course. Um, just tell us a, a little bit about your diagnosis of early onset dementia. Um, how has it affected you and your family? Well, good morning. Thank you for having me on. Um, yeah, it was um, almost four years ago now that I first, uh, first went to the doctors struggling with uh, short-term memory, concentration, um, I would struggle in a group situation to take in noise of a conversation. And then I was putting it down to everyday living and stress. And I went on a bike ride that I've done lots of times from my house and got lost and had this blackout moment um, and came back pretty shook up. And from there, went to, to my doctors. And that's where the testing started almost four years ago. And what role do you believe rugby had in this? Well, we just weren't educated on uh, on concussion. Uh, I'd never heard of sub-concussion, which is every impact is causing a small bit of damage. Um, and we we were doing, it was, rugby had only just turned professional. Uh, in 95, I'd signed my first contract and we, we were doing so much contact, do, con contact during the week leading up to a game. It was ridiculous. It wasn't policed. Uh, when you had a, uh, a, a concussion and you were feeling a bit dazed, you just had sniffing salts and you you were expected to, to carry on. So do you think we should still be encouraging children to play rugby or do you think it's possible to manage the risk? Uh, it's, a, it's a tough one. I think the age of which they start contact at the moment is too young. 
Uh, it's it's nine. I started when I was four, and contact was allowed at four. So nine is obviously better than than four. Uh, but for me, I think we've got to look at the age of maybe fourteen to start introducing contact to uh, sixteen. It being a, a full game that we give the brain time to develop at that young age, um, and it, it will be a lot safer then. Uh, going forward, all the changes we want to make, or I say all 95% of the changes we want to make to make rugby safer, because I still love rugby. I'm cycling to, to Leon to watch the game on Sunday, is off the pitch. So when there is a traumatic brain injury, a concussion, a player doesn't return in seven days. Uh, in boxing, it's six to eight weeks, but a rugby player can return and play in seven days. We want that increase to 28 days. Um, also, the amount of contact players do in training, we want that police like the NFL did 15 years ago. At the moment, there's guidelines, uh, and, and I know some teams are very good at this, but it's not the same across the board. So you mentioned your cycle for, from uh, London to, to Lyon. This is a part of fundraising for your, for your charity, Head for Change. Uh, just tell us a little bit about that. Why did you found it, and, and what, it, what is it you're hoping it will do? Well, after my diagnosis, it became obvious there was there was nothing out there for for forty year olds uh, with regards to support uh, advice, and we we started Head for Change. Um, there's three key areas: um, care and support for the ex players and their family, uh, education, which I believe if we get it right, with educating the, the youngsters, grassroots, mums and dad, coaches, uh, those uh, players will have much more knowledge when one happens and to come off the pitch straight away um, and not return to have the correct rest and then independent research where 100% of the research is made public. Um, so with Head for Change, uh, it's been a, a busy busy few years since since launching uh, and this challenge cycling down to uh, to to Leon is going to be yeah a, a tough one. It's it's over 500 miles, quite a lot of climbing. Um, fingers crossed, it's not too hot like it was there a few weeks ago. Um, but yeah, it's to to raise awareness of our our charity and 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 get people to donate any spare pennies and choose to be part of the solution. And Alex, just before we let you go, I mean, you say you still love rugby, but if you knew now, if you knew then what you know now about the impact it's had on you, would you still have played and wanted the career you had? Well, I, it's, it's, it's difficult for, for a player. They're gladiators. Uh, it should be taken out of the player's hand and uh, you should be uh, um, told that you can't return. Um, I would have just, from what I know now, I would have given my 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 brain the recovery it needed after those subconcussive hits when I was feeling dazed in training almost every day, uh, and and having sniffing socks to get back on the field. I would have given myself the time I needed, my brain needed to recover, and that that isn't happening, and wasn't happening. Alex Popham, former Welsh national rugby player, great to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's get a look at the weather now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, after the recent thunderstorms and localised flooding in the south, this week looks a little more autumnal with spells of wind and rain. A warm start for many, especially in the muggy south where there have been some thundery downpours. Rain moving across Britain this morning will turn showery in the south, allowing early thunderstorms in the southeast to clear away. A mix of sunshine and showers over Ireland and Northern Ireland will follow to most other places, but North East Scotland will stay cloudy and wet. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. The familiar faces of Ramsey Street, Erinsborough, will return to our screens today. Neighbours has been revived by the streaming platform Amazon after what was supposed to be its grand finale last summer. A big deal for those of us of a certain generation. Gosh, what's happened in the last two years? Well, coming up in the next hour of Breakfast, the latest on the allegations against Russell Brand.
Hello, good morning. It's nine o'clock. The comedian Russell Brand is facing more allegations this morning about his treatment of women. The chair of the Commons Women's and Equalities Committee tells us more support is needed for alleged victims. It's Monday, the 18th of September. The Times says they've been contacted by several women since publishing claims of rape, sexual assault and emotional abuse. We've seen far too much victim blaming and shaming of individuals who need to be supported at the current time. The BBC and Channel 4 have announced their own investigations into Russell Brand, who denies all the allegations against him. Also ahead in Libya, aid teams scramble to prevent another disaster, the spread of disease. We are in Denna, where residents are still grappling with the shock of their loss. Raising the flag over liberated territory, Ukrainian forces claim a second significant gain in three days. Labour tell the Prime Minister to reject Liz Truss's honours list, calling it a reward for crashing the economy. And why pandas look so sleepy, new research finds they get jet lag. Good morning, thanks for joining us. The Metropolitan Police has urged victims of sexual assault to come forward no matter how long ago it happened. The force issued the statement following allegations of sexual assault, rape and coercive behaviour against the comedian Russell Brand, which were published by the Sunday Times and Channel 4's dispatches. The paper says that they are now investigating new allegations from more women who have contacted them. Mr Brand denies any wrongdoing, insisting that all of his relationships were consensual. While Charlotte Griffiths was a journalist in her 20s when alleged offences took place in the early 2000s and met Russell Brand on the party and celebrity circuit. Well, Sky correspondent Sabah Chowdhury joins me now. Uh, and Sabah, tell us a little bit more about uh, the new people who are coming forward. Good morning there, Jane. So, so with a little bit of context, so there was an investigation uh, that uh, came out over the weekend. It was launched by Channel 4, The Times and The Sunday Times newspaper. And in this, uh, they report that four women are alleging that they were sexually assaulted by uh, the 48-year-old comedian Russell Brand. Some of their accusations include uh, rape, uh, controlling, abusive and predatory behaviour, they say, uh, all of these things which uh, the 48-year-old vehemently denies. He says all of his relationships have been consensual. That's something that he stressed in a video published last week. Now, to answer your question, today the Times newspaper are reporting that since their report came out over the weekend, more women have come forwards with fresh allegations uh, about sexual assault uh, from Russell Brand. Now, these are allegations that are still being investigated by the Times newspaper. And in the meantime, the Metropolitan Police have issued a statement. They have said that they are looking into the matter and that they are urging uh, alleged victims to come forward. So they've said the following. We are aware of media reporting of a series of allegations of sexual assault. At this time, we have not received any reports in relation to this. If anyone believes they have been the victim of a sexual assault, no matter how long ago it was, we would encourage them to contact police. Now, Russell Brand's uh, former employers, Channel 4 and uh, BBC, have also issued statements. Um, so they've got internal investigations ongoing. The BBC uh, specifically have said this. The documentary and associated reports uh, contained serious allegations spanning a number of years. Russell Brand worked on BBC Radio programmes between 2006 and 2008, and we are urgently looking into the issues raised. Now, Brand's uh, literary agent, Tavistock Wood, uh, have dropped the uh, former actor. They've come, cut all professional ties with him, and similarly, a domestic abuse charity that he's worked quite closely with have also done the same. Now, moving forwards, the next few days are going to be interesting. There are massive questions being posed for the big TV bosses. Uh, 
whether, you know, how, if they were aware of the concerns that were being raised about Russell Brand uh, over the past 10, 15 years, and if they were, what was being done about them? Okay, Sarah, thanks very much. Well, these allegations still dominate the papers today. Uh, the Times, which was involved in this joint investigation, says more women have come forward since the story broke on Saturday. While The Sun covers the urgent inquiry being launched at the BBC as police ask accusers to come forward to them. The Telegraph also focuses on the presenter's former employee, BBC forced into urgent inquiry over brand. And The Mirror has the headline, What did TV chiefs know? The Metro asks the same question. Now, a week on from the floods in Libya, more than 10,000 people are still missing in the port city of Derna. And aid workers are scrambling to prevent another disaster, the spread of disease. Our Africa correspondent Yusra al is in Derna. They're, they're giving out masks. They're taking the initiative to kind of warn people. There's a lot of antibacterial uh, liquid being handed out. People are trying to be mindful wearing, wearing, you know, technical gear when they're dealing with bodies. Now more than a thousand bodies have been buried in mass graves up in the mountain, kind of further upstream from, from the dams. But th these mass graves do represent to people that chance that they didn't get to bury their loved ones. Those that were lucky were able to have a body identified and be told that their loved ones were found and confirmed dead. But the majority, the majority of people here have just assumed that their, their missing loved ones are now dead after the 72-hour window passed. And I think we've done a lot of work to understand the technicalities of this disaster, how the dams failed, how this could happen. But really to, to, to know the true scale is to speak to people here and, and know that surviving comes at a massive cost. There are families, one down the road lost 55 members in one family, their funerals all over the city. And one child who survived miraculously, an 11 year old who was swept away to sea and then washed back up to the shore with just a few scratches has lost his entire family. And we we've, we've really feel like that was just devastating for him, even though it's a miracle. So people have to kind of adjust and deal with something so, so visceral and so violent after surviving years of political violence. Well, we've spoken to the Conservative and the Labour Party this morning, uh, the Labour Party being particularly scathing about Liz Truss and her record in office. Uh, the former Bank of England governor, Mark Carney, has also accused her of turning Britain into Argentina. When Brexiteers tried to create Singapore on the Thames, the Truss government instead delivered Argentina on the Channel. Well, Mari Aurora is here, our political correspondent. And, and Liz Truss is making a speech today, isn't yeah. she? Uh, reflecting on her, her time and, and also looking at what she thinks the current government could have done differently. Yes, exactly. So she feels very much that she's actually been unfairly treated on some of her promises when it comes to the kind of go for growth agenda. So uh, her speech is, according to her team, is very much not an attack on Rishi Sunak, but more of a defence of her position and a defence of what... She they see and she sees as a tax on what they called unfunded tax cuts. Now, she doesn't agree with that characterisation, essentially, and that's one of the reasons she's making the speech today. She's expected also to call for things from the Prime Minister, like tax cuts, we know uh, those are a big uh, favourite of hers, but also shrinking the welfare spending, raising the retirement age. And actually, she wants Rishi Sunak to be a bit more of a free marketeer. She's seen as a free marketeer, and she wants Rishi Sunak to also kind of adopt that ideology. She's also concerned about some green commitments and wants him to maybe potentially roll back or uh, kind of tone them down slightly as well in terms of the cost for the taxpayer. The issue is, we know from Laura Trott this morning, the DWP minister, she was adamant that actually Liz Truss was wrong, Liz Truss, uh, her, her commitments were wrong and Rishi is on the right track. But if you speak to Tory MPs behind the scenes, I mean, there are a reasonable number of Tory MPs who actually still feel that Liz Truss was right all along. They just felt that the execution of the vision was wrong. So some MPs you speak to say, actually, no, we are right. We are still very much in a kind of stagflation zone, which is very dangerous for the UK's economy. And actually, they want to see more kind of ambitious uh, growth policies that, you know, Liz Truss uh, was very much uh, in favour of. OK, Maureen, thanks very much. 
Now, Ukrainian forces say they've recaptured a frontline village near Bakhmut, which would be their second significant gain in three days. The village lies on higher ground, which has been the scene of intense fighting for weeks around six miles south of Bakhmut in the east of the country. Bakhmut was captured by Russia in May. The village itself has been largely destroyed by heavy shelling. Ukrainian forces filmed themselves raising a blue and yellow flag over the ruins. They've hailed the advance as a technically, a tactically significant staging post for further offensive actions. I would like to especially recognize the warriors who are gradually regaining Ukraine's territory in the area of Bakhmut. The 80th Air Assault Brigade, the 5th Separate Assault Brigade and Fury Joint Assault Brigade of the National Police. Klishivka, well done. Well, let's take a look at some of the day's other headlines now. And NHS leaders have warned that historic joint strikes by junior doctors and consultants this week will bring the worst disruption yet. Consultants in England will walk out for 48 hours from Tuesday and will be joined by their colleagues on Wednesday. Thousands of appointments are to be cancelled or pushed back. A lorry driver has been jailed after police in Essex seized £70,000 in criminal cash disguised as sandwiches. Marius Raksinski was arrested after the money, wrapped in tin foil, was discovered in the cab of the vehicle. The 28-year-old was sentenced to 20 weeks in prison after pleading guilty. Exeter Airport has reopened this morning after torrential rain flooded the terminal area. Thunderstorms also caused disruption on the roads in southern England. The worst of the weather appears to be over for now, but there's a stormy week ahead. So, why has it been so wet and stormy? Well, our Sky Meteorologist Kirsty McCabe is here with me now. What's causing this particular buffeting weather that we're <laughs> seeing across the UK? Um, it's just an unfortunate repetition of showers. So we had quite a lot of heat across southern parts of the UK over the weekend. And we've had that obviously quite a hot September for parts of the country as well. And then we've got this pulses of thunderstorms moving up from France and this extra heat, this extra energy in the atmosphere just gave it a little bit more oomph to them. So we saw repeated pulses of showers and thunderstorms and over a very short space of time, for some places just a couple of hours, they saw an extremely large amount of rainfall fall, but widely 40 to 60 millimetres fell in parts of Devon in particular across the southwest of England. Then the area of thunderstorms moved its way last night. So mainly affected the extra area during the day, but then it moved its way. You can see from the rainfall picture here, the rainfall moving through yesterday, moved up across central parts of England over towards Lincolnshire, Yorkshire coast. And that's now clearing away this morning. But many people woken up overnight and some quite extreme rainfall totals. Some of those numbers there actually only fell in the space of a couple of hours. So a month's worth of rain falling in the space of a day or less. So quite an extreme amount of rainfall. When you get such a large amount of rainfall falling in a short space of time, there's nowhere for the water to go. It can't possibly be absorbed that quickly so you get a lot of runoff um, and then Dawlish, the river that runs through the town there burst its banks so we've seen just the impact from a short space of time we've seen an awful lot of rainfall fall causing the problems there are worries that there's more rain to come this week we're kind of stuck with quite an autumnal feel so we'll notice a real change in the temperatures it's much fresher but we've got more areas of low pressure moving through that's going to bring in further spells of wet and windy weather so I think really this week because some places have already had issues it's keeping an eye on the forecast because there is more rain to come as the week goes on. Okay Kirsty thanks a lot. Now, sexual abuse survivors and their families have joined child safety experts in calling on big tech companies to ensure their platforms are safe for youngsters. They've highlighted security features like end-to-end -end encryption and messaging services which they fear offenders are hiding behind as they target children. Shingi Mariki reports. At this time, he was asking for pictures of me, and then those requests started to get more and more explicit. It was Sorry about that. We're clearly having some problems technically with that story. Uh, we will get a lot more uh, coming up after the break. We'll try and bring that to you a bit later. Uh, we'll give you more on the aid flowing into Libya and what people need as new dangers emerge after the flood disaster. A promise of EU help for Italy to deal with its land producer migrants crisis, but will it be enough? And why the dark circles? New research about pandas could hold the answer. We arrive. 
a secret hospital hidden in the Myanmar jungle, treating the victims of this bloody war. This is hardcore emergency medicine in the hardest of circumstances. So you'll be doing brain surgery today. Uh, maybe. Here, the resistance lives or dies. It's been quite remarkable. You have to see these things, but thinking hurts when you do it. Italy is being promised help from the EU to deal with the migration crisis on the island of Lampedusa. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen visited yesterday after the arrival of more than 7,000 people in a week, doubling the island's population. Well, our international correspondent John Sparks is on the island for us. Uh, and John, this island has seen many migrants in the past, but never before in, in such a large number in such a short period of time. Yeah, that, that... That's absolutely right, Jane. I mean, it's a really contentious issue. And I think we can just give you a flavour of that right now. We're, we're standing at the, the edge of the port in Lampedusa. And on this side, I'll just ask my camera operator to come over. You've got holiday makers about to set sail, bronzed Italians ready to go out to the, to the neighbouring beaches. And then if we pull back this way, come back behind me, you can see the main dock. And this is where more than 11,000 migrants have disembarked after their perilous journey from North Africa. We are situated just 60 miles from the Tunisian coast. Again, migrants, they disembark here, and it has caused real problems in, here on, on Lampedusa. And that is why the Italian Prime Minister and the head of the EU Commission decided to come here yesterday on a fact-finding mission. The strange thing was that when they arrived, 
most of the new arrivals had gone. After days of chaos on Lampedusa, a week where the community doubled in size, the road to the reception centre was empty. The facility, providing accommodation to migrants, was getting a clean, and the number of occupants had been substantially reduced. A visit by the Italian Prime Minister may have had something to do with it. Italy's pugnacious PM, Giorgia Maloney, arrived with the head of the European Commission. Giorgio, is this a problem you can actually solve? Can you I'm solve this problem? That. I'm working on that, said Maloney, who was joined by Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. They said it was important to see the situation on the island themselves. But what they were presented with at the centre and the port was an alternative reality. Previously, we saw hundreds of migrants standing on this dock. Now there were none. The contrast wasn't lost on local residents. Vanya told me, we're tired of politicians coming here, finding everything clean and orderly, and leaving. They make a thousand promises, and it starts over again. The Italians have the capability to process migrants on Lampedusa, the speedy cleanups proof of that. But Giorgia Maloney says the responsibility must be shared. And the Commission president responded with a 10-point action plan. We have an obligation as part of the international community, but we will decide who comes to the European Union and under what circumstances, and not the smugglers and traffickers. Problem is, the smugglers are servicing demand, and demand is huge. John, from Sierra Leone, reached the EU on his fourth attempt. Yes, I was in Morocco. I tried there twice. I never made it. So I, I tried to come back okay. to Tunis. Then I tried it once, then I make it. Right. So you, you've spent a lot of money. Yes, I spent a lot of your... money. True, a lot, a lot of money, a lot of money. This island now symbolizes Europe's migration crisis and new action plans and strategies are unlikely to fix it. You know, Jane, the Italian papers have been interviewing residents on Lampedusa, and, and some of them have said that this cleanup has been so effective that their island now looks like Switzerland. I, I'm not sure about that, but I do think the, the actions that we've seen over the last 24 hours reflect the fact that the Italians do have the means and the capability of, of both policing and processing migrants on this island. I think the issue here, both in Italy and in the EU, is about responsibility, and it's about cost. And it's also about tactics, I think. The Italian Prime Minister, uh, Giorgia Maloney, she has advocated a naval blockade, essentially pushing back the boats towards North Africa. But there would be a consequence there in terms of the death toll. A, a dangerous journey would be made even more dangerous. But for her, the political imperative here is bringing down the numbers of migrants. In fact, her political career may depend on it. John, thanks very much. Well, let's return now to the situation in Libya. And emergency workers there are continuing to clear rubble in the eastern city of Derna nearly a week after the devastating flooding there killed thousands. The number of people still missing is estimated to be more than 10,000. Let's talk now to Andrew Thomas from the Red Cross. Uh, Andrew, good to talk to you today. Uh, what's the latest from your teams on the ground in Derna? How are they managing? Well, we've had 450 uh, volunteers from the Libyan Red Crescent who've really been there since the moment this catastrophe happened. I mean, the advantage we have as an organisation is we are locally based. We are the umbrella organisation here in Geneva for Red Crescent Red Cross societies around the world. And those 450 Red Crescent volunteers were either living in Derna already or in the surrounding areas. So they were some of the first on the scene. The situation is that Derna has really become much of a ghost town, really. Most of the people who survived this have now left that city. There's very little places still to 
live in there. It's so, I mean, you can see in these pictures, absolutely destroyed, as we all now know. Um, our volunteers are still trying to see if there's any chance of anybody still alive, very, very unlikely now, under rubble and so on. But they're also just trying to work out the needs of the population who have remained in the city and those who've left as well. And those needs are still very, very great. They're obviously include clean water. They include basic ready-to-eat meals. They include shelter the things that are all required after tragedies like this. Now, the good news is that other Red Crescent societies from other countries have been able to get in and get aid in. They've come from Egypt, from Italy, from Tunisia, from Turkey. And we have somebody from the IFRC, the umbrella organization, on their way to Derna right now to have a look and work out exactly what the ongoing needs will be, because this is not something that's going to get sorted. But are we a week on now? It's going to take months and months and months to get that city into anything like a livable state again. And in terms of, of, of bodies, we know that there are many, many thousands of people dead there and there is great concern about the number of bodies. But in, in terms of, of dealing with their disposal uh, and, and burial, uh, you're urging caution. Just explain a little. We are, because the dead bodies in themselves are actually not a health risk. It's a bit of a myth that they are. When dead bodies are in water, they can absolutely pollute the water. And obviously, people don't want to be drinking that water because there's a huge risk of diseases, including cholera and so on, if they do. But the downside of burying people too fast is that you deny the relatives the certainty of what has happened to their loved one. And that can be very, very traumatic for the living, not to know. So if you have mass burials, you run that risk that a relative disappeared and no one knows what happened to them. So it's very, very important that it's an ordered, dignified process before somebody gets that dignified burial. And barring an impossibility of it, you find out who that person was and you let their relatives know. And if possible, you let them say their goodbye. It's no different in Libya as any other country. So as I say, in, its, in themselves, dead bodies don't pose a health risk certainly a week on. You obviously need to bury bodies eventually, and bodies, of course, tragically rot and can, as I say, pollute water. But what you don't want to do is be over hasty, and what you certainly don't want to do is go for mass burials of anonymous bodies, because that really can be very, very traumatic for those left behind. Mm. While we have you, Mag, just ask you a quick question about Morocco. Of course, the earthquake there a couple of weeks ago now. Um, fears of heavy rains potentially hitting that area. Is there, is there a real concern about landslides? There really is. The heavy rains are due on Wednesday. And at the moment, I was just speaking to a colleague just a few minutes ago who is driving up right now on some of those mountain roads. And he's been telling me for a few days now how precarious those roads are. He was saying in some cases you can see it's basically one boulder holding back a whole lot of other boulders. And when that rain comes down on Wednesday, the real fear is that some of those sort of crucial boulders will shift and then bring an awful lot of mud and rocks down with them. And so many people there, still many, many thousands, living in incredibly pre pre precarious states. Yes, mostly now some kind of basic shelter has arrived, but most people are living in tents right next door to their destroyed houses. And those, of course, are still in the pathways of some of the rocks that could come tumbling down on them. So a very, very precarious situation there. And also it's getting very, very cold at night. 10 degrees might not sound horribly cold, but with a bitter wind as well. It's really, really cold at night. And the tents so far that have got to those people in the mountains of Morocco don't have any kind of insulation. They're not winterized in any way. They're just sheltering there from the rain. So the need's still very, very great there. And yes, you're right. To a certain extent, Morocco was overshadowed by Libya. I mean, what was the chance of two horrendous disasters over the space of four days? But it happened and we have to deal with both at the same time. And that's why the British Red Cross, if you go to their website, you can donate to both the Moroccan earthquake tragedy and the Libyan flood tragedy. We shouldn't be looking to compete these things, but people can help by donating money to those two causes at the British Red Cross's website. OK, Andrew Thomas uh, from the Red Cross. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks. Right, let's get a look at the weather here now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. After the recent thunderstorms and localised flooding in the south, this week looks more autumnal with spells of wind and rain. A warm start for many, especially in the muggy south, where there have been some thundery downpours. 
Rain moving across Britain this morning will turn showery in the south, allowing early thunderstorms in the southeast to clear away. A mix of sunshine and showers over Ireland and Northern Ireland will follow to most other places. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. The research out this morning could help us understand the sleepy nature of pandas. The study from Scotland's University of Stirling suggests the black and white bears suffer jet lag, just like us, when they're held in zoos that are located further north than where they would usually live. Is that why they have such big black circles? Now, scientists want to look at whether pandas' moods and motivation are impacted by seasonal affective disorder. Still ahead on Sky News Breakfast, our political operators are standing by to discuss all the top stories coming out of Westminster this week. Well, let's return to our top story, the rape and sex abuse allegations against Russell Brand. The Metropolitan Police has urged victims of sexual assault to come forward, no matter how long ago it happened. Earlier, I spoke to Caroline Noakes, the chair of the Commons Women and Equalities Committee. Well, I think very clearly there needs to be a criminal investigation. In order for that to happen, these poor victims need to be supported and encouraged and empowered to go to the police and uh, take them through a process that needs to be supportive of them. Over the course of the last 36 hours, we've seen far too much victim blaming and shaming of individuals who need to be supported at the current time and not criticised. 
So do you think that that is why perhaps these women feel more comfortable talking to journalists uh, and newspapers rather than the police? Well, I think there's a real anxiety about going to the police. Questions that still linger over the uh, appalling incidents at things like Charing Cross Police Station where there was very obvious misogyny in the Metropolitan Police. So victims are reluctant to speak out and they need to be supported through the process. It's why that there are uh, specialists now who are able to do that. But I think what we've seen over the course of the last two days is more victims coming forward. And there certainly is um, a sense of strength in numbers. Women who hadn't previously been brave enough to, uh, to make allegations against a very powerful and influential individual are now feeling brave enough to do so. And to be frank, that's a good thing. But do you not have any concerns or discomfort about the fact that this is, in essence, a trial by the media, not the UK's judicial system? And, you know, there are a lot of people who are questioning whether it's right that these crimes, alleged crimes, have been reported openly without there being any actual criminal charges. Well, that's why I absolutely started this interview by saying that we needed these victims to come forward to the police. We need this to be investigated both sides of the Atlantic, both by the Metropolitan Police and in Los Angeles. Unfortunately, powerful men, and it usually is men, tend to be surrounded by a wall of silence by people who protect them or by people who are, quite frankly, scared to speak out themselves because their jobs are reliant on that individual. And what we have to see, I think, in this instance, is a proper criminal investigation. We need to get to the bottom of these allegations and there needs to be a judicial process. My committee is currently midway through uh, an inquiry looking at misogyny in sport, misogyny in the music industry, and there clearly will have to be recommendations to the government as to how we can better protect, how we can uh, look after women and girls, how we can tackle the cultures of misogyny. Well, Caroline Noakes, I spoke to a short while ago. Uh, well, here on the sofa, we've got Sonia Soda, Chief Lead Writer and Columnist at The Observer, and also Katie Balls, Political Editor at The Spectator, to talk us through uh, the week's politics, but also reflecting on, on that as well. Uh, and, and Sonia, to you first of all, how, how do you feel about the coverage of this story? Do you think if it had been a politician, perhaps, who, who had allegations against him but no criminal charges, would we still be covering it in such depth and interest? I think so, yes, absolutely. And, I mean, it really mirrors Me Too sort of revelations that we've had in the past that have involved very serious criminal um, allegations of criminal wrongdoing that were, in those cases were actually gone on to uh, be upheld in the courts. I'm thinking of Harvey Weinstein. But I think whichever domain this happened in, we would be reporting it in the same way as the media because it, they're incredibly serious allegations. They're very distressing to read about and there's something about this story that there is in common with other um, kind of sorts of stories like this which is that it just so happens that it was essentially an open secret so people in the industry knew of these allegations they knew that Russell Brand had a reputation and yet it proved very difficult to do anything about it and in fact it doesn't seem to have harmed his career at all um, so I think you know this is comedy but we've had similar revelations. You know, we've had them in, in politics before. Uh, we've had them in the film industry. Um, we've had them in, in re with response to kind of very se se senior business people. And so the question is, you know, what, what's going to change going forward so that this behaviour isn't, isn't sort of covered up? And, and Katie, Caroline knows they're saying, you know, she, she thinks that the broadcasters are, are going to have serious questions to ask and that they potentially will be hauled into Parliament to be, to be questioned about this. Yes, and that seems to be where it's going now. I mean, I think when it comes to the story, obviously there's a report today in The Times, which is part of their original investigation, um, saying more women have come forward. They still need to obviously look through that, be verified. There's a question, to Sonia's point, about whether this now gets passed to the police, if women choose to go forward there. Um, but I think more immediately, questions for all the broadcasters, um, you know, whether they were complicit in this, who knew what. And it does feel as though the hint so far that this could be a case where they are asked to come before parliament, uh, you know, before committees and uh, pressed in that sense. And some of this to see what, what do they do of their own accord and it tends to be, if, if they don't look as though they're doing things, that increases the chance that Parliament MPs are going to want to get involved. 
OK. Uh, so looking ahead to the rest of the week, Sonia, we think we might get uh, news this week from H on HS2 from the government. We had both the government and the, and the, and the Labour Party on the, on the sofa this morning. Um, what do we know about the government's plans? So it sounds like from what we've been hearing over the weekend, the government may announce plans this week to scrap the bit, the leg of HS2 that would take uh, the rail link directly into Euston. And instead it would stop somewhere in North London. I can't quite remember the station name, but it's somewhere, uh, somewhere I'd never heard of actually, London, but I am a South Londoner. Um, but um, it's somewhere where you'd have to, passengers would have to disembark and get the um, Elizabeth line to, uh, to sort of connect into central London. And um, reports suggest that the, this could save somewhere in the region of 4.8 billion. I mean, to me, it shows a really deep-seated issue with government decisions around investment, which is that in order to shave off a few billions, you know, in the here and now, and 4.7 billion isn't that much money when you th in the grand scheme of long-term infrastructure investment for the country. So in order to save that small uh, amount in the here and now, you're actually, um, you know, compromising much bigger savings because of the impact on economic growth later down the line. So I think a lot of people are looking at this decision and, and saying, once you've decided to build HS2 and with all the money that's gone into it, it is crazy to make a decision like this. So it, well, it doesn't even reach central London um, just to shave off kind of what it is essentially a small percentage of the project, project's costs. But Katie, having said that, John Ashworth for Labour wouldn't commit to Labour. You know, he said in principle, Labour absolutely behind HS2 really believe in levelling up the north but that we're going to make it we're going to wait to make a concrete decision until we finally look at the figures yes and you have dan jarvis from labor you know suggesting that this should go ahead obviously with his former hat on as as a mayor uh but i think it reflects the fact to sonia's point there are some things that if you are tight on money and there's not that much to go around it's much easier to put off delay sometimes just stop long-term investment decisions rather than think about day-to-day -day spending. And I think you can see that both in what the Tories are thinking about when Jeremy Hunt is thinking autumn statement, then the spring one, we want to do a tax cut, all these various things. Um, and what Labour is saying in response, because uh, the Labour Party is also acutely aware that they don't have much money to go around. And I think that's why, it's, at the moment at least, does not feel so it's going to be much of a, a slanging match on this one, because both parties are in fairly similar positions when it comes to the limits of the economic picture right now. OK. Um, Liz Truss today, we've got a, a speech from her reflecting in her very short period in power and also a critique of Rishi Sunak's government, we understand. A welcome intervention, Sonia? Well, I don't think... I, I'm struggling to think who might welcome it across the country. I certainly don't think that there'll be many uh, people in the Conservative Party uh, who welcome it. I think it's a period that lots of MPs would rather forget, quite frankly, because if we look at what she achieved in her premiership, she and um, her Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, they, they effectively took decisions that everyone warned at the time, most economic experts warned, uh, were going to have huge consequences, and they did. They tanked the economy, and uh, they had to resile from it. But it's also had a long-term impact. So the steps that they took and the impact that that had on the markets, that has undermined, in a long-term way, um, bond markets' confidence in um, government uh, bonds. And it's had a permanent impact on the cost of borrowing. So we now pay more as a country to borrow than we would have done had Liz Truss not undertaken uh, the steps that she had. But in this speech, I mean, she's coming out fighting. She's saying, you know, yes, I, maybe I tried to do a bit too much too quickly, but I was still right. And actually it was people, you know, it, it's the rest of the world that wouldn't fall into line with what I wanted to do. Um, and I think that there are some in the Conservative Party who will feel that that is a bit rich. Kate, there are some that may feel it's a bit rich, but but also there are, even though Sandy said that you know she hasn't really got any supporters in the party, there there are a lot of backbenchers still who believe in her plan for growth, aren't there? Yeah, I think you have to separate uh, MPs who believe in Liz Truss as the politician they want to lead the party or even have much of a, you know a front-facing role, and MPs who agree with lots of the ideas she had and think the execution was wrong. So I think that you speak to some who are sympathetic with the ideas, you think that Liz Truss should be owning up more to the fact that, you know, it's not just, a, as we're expecting her, her to say in the speech, you know, institution MPs out to get her, she herself made mistakes. And then I think there is this point which is, 
who is Liz Truss trying to speak to right now? And it feels as though it's not as though number 10 are going to be listening to the speech thinking, oh, well, that's a good one for the autumn statement. Um, but I think you could have a situation whereby if the Tories do lose the next election, current polls suggest they'd be on course to do that, there will be a battle of ideas. And therefore, I think some of Liz Truss's thinking could be, uh, you know, advanced by MPs. But again, I think that is, you know, that's where some of the ideas are, are worth probably listening to because we might hear them later in terms of what the Tories will be talking about if there is a defeat. But I think that's different than, uh, you know, firm support for Liz Truss, which I think there is much of in the Tory party. Mm. Uh, and Sonia, final thought, uh, Labour trying to block Liz Truss's list of honours. I mean, mm. they're not going to have much success, are they? Um, I mean, probably not, but I think it's a good thing for them to be picking a political fight on because I think it exposes one of the, um, you know, the craziness of the honour system, really, which is that I think you can justify an honour system absolutely to reward people who have objectively contributed to the country in all kinds of way. But too often the honour system acts as, you know, presence for people close to a prime minister who've done their job. And Liz Truss, you know, she's had one of the shortest... Uh, terms as Prime Minister um, ever. So the idea that she gets to hand out these gongs, um, you know, as a result of her disastrous premiership, is, feels really galling. So I think it's a very good line for Labour to attack on. OK, we're going to have to leave it there, I'm afraid. Sonia Soda, uh, Katie Balls, thanks both for taking us through what's going to be happening this week in politics. Uh, coming up, it's just over a year, of course, since we also said goodbye to Neighbours, as well as Liz Truss. It's relaunching again today. We'll hear what some of the stars think about the comeback. Westminster, the heart of British politics, where laws are made and scandal is never far away. Whether it's how much rent you pay, the school your kids go to, the businesses that survive on your high street, what happens here matters. But it's time for a new type of politics show. We'll focus on the issues that affect you, but we promise to have a bit of fun along the way. So join me as we analyse, explore and discover on the Politics Hub on Sky News.
Slight emirates. Slight better. Fly Emirates, fly better. Now, the Metropolitan Police says it'll be talking to the Sunday Times and Channel 4 after they've published allegations against the comedian Russell Brand of rape and the sexual assault of four women. The Met wants any potential victims to contact them and to know how to report crimes to the police. Russell Brand denies the allegations and Sky News has also approached him for comment as more women come forward with accusations. Well, the entertainment journalist Caroline Frost uh, joins me now to talk more about this. And Caroline's been quite a sort of 48 hours, hasn't it, on this story. What do you make of how it's unfolded? Very interesting. It's moved so quickly. So um, just a few days ago, we were told there would be a huge expose about somebody. We didn't know what. Uh, very much in keeping with the Me Too movement and bringing historic allegations to light. And then, of course, over the weekend, Russell Brand made a preemptive statement that he knew he was the subject of this investigation. And uh, he used his very powerful platform to refute and reject what he called Baroque allegations. Um, so it's a game of two halves. It's become very polarised. If you talk, just look across social media, on the one hand, you have a, a bunch of people who are shocked by all of these allegations and um, really very critical of him and talking about um, breaking ties with charities, etc., and saying he isn't on the mainstream media anymore. And then you've got the other bunch of people that he has effectively mobilised and, and saying, well, of course, you said that they would come for you and now they have. So very much seeing the story as part of what he's talked about, which is a mainstream media coordinated attack on him because he is a disruptor and has such a powerful platform. So if we accept that we have to say that he has rejected all of these allegations against him and said that they um, anything that happened in his previous life was within the context of consensual relationships and we accept that the allegations are very serious and ongoing. It's a very interesting um, cultural um, sort of chasm that is, that is breaking apart between people who are um, rightly critical of him and then people who are rightly protective and saying there is um, a case to be answered but not in the media and court of public opinion. It's a huge story of which he is effectively the totem. And, and in terms of, of him himself, um, you know, he's chosen just to make his own statement and, and control it that way, refusing mm. other, uh, other mainstream media who've approached him to ask him for comment, mm. but went ahead with this gig on Saturday night and now questions possibly about the gig that he's due to do tomorrow night, I think. Mm. Uh, what did you make of, of, of that appearance at that gig? I, for me, that was the defining moment because we had him giving uh, his statement on Friday night, very much um, seeking to take control of the narrative, going in ahead before any statements had been made, any TV programme had been shown, any publication in the newspapers. I mean, extraordinarily um, assertive, taking the initiative, um, but in fact, taking, making the decision to take that gig on. On He stood in front of 2,000 fans. We saw people holding up banners, we're with you. He got a standing ovation. He effectively... Um, has come out fighting. He said, there are things I can't talk to you about, but there are many things I do want to talk to you about tonight. Thank you for coming out. I love you, I love you. I mean, this is the Russell Brand spiel. On the one hand, he's got this kind of Dickensian vocabulary and he's always been um, sort of libertine and he's delighted. I mean, that's been his whole persona, his shtick. And on the other hand, he does have the ability to corral his troops and this is why he's been so effective in building up this brand um, away from mainstream media. I mean, it, it's we're seeing a, a kind of a new shift in people's effectiveness of how they can get their stories out and control their message. Are you surprised that he hasn't apologised? You know, you could you imagine anybody who was facing these allegations, whether or not you could still deny your, your you say you're innocent, but you could also say, and I'm really sorry if if, if actions had been misconstrued or if mm. I'd overstepped a line, and you know, I, I thought, you know, yeah, but but no sense of contrition. Does that surprise no. you? That's, well, that's what makes him so singular. I mean, as you're absolutely right, we've seen a handful of 
celebrities, whenever there's been any discussion about sort of historic offences, are quick to say, it's not who I am, it's not who I was, and if there was any misunderstanding and anybody was made to feel uncomfortable, I can only apologise. Russell Brand has never been that kind of person. His whole persona is built on a sort of contrary, libertine, um, free love. I mean, he's, this, this is what he's built his brand on. It's been quite interesting that he's kind of effectively left all of this behind. And in the last, what, sort of half a decade, he's become a wellness guru. He's become a married father. He's become a person who delights in wanting pe to help people. He runs wellness retreats. It's a very different uh, brand that he's built. And this has come back to bite him. I mean, I don't know. It'd be fascinating to see what he thinks of that, that previous person. He would probably talk about the journey he's been on. Mm -hmm. But it's, I mean, at the time, he never said he was anything other than a man looking to get far more and more um, notches on his bedpost and many people were willing to help him in that I should add I mean we've, we've, we've both journal we've seen women throwing themselves at him very charismatic person the, the big questions are whether he has exploited that position to um, to meaner ends Caroline Frost entertainment journalist interested to talk to you thank you very much right let's get a quick look at the weather Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, after the recent thunderstorms and the localised flooding in the south, this week looks more autumnal with spells of wind and rain. A warm start for many, especially in the muggy south, where there have been some thundery downpours. Rain moving across Britain this morning will turn showery in the south, allowing early thunderstorms in the southeast to clear away. A mix of sunshine and showers over Ireland and Northern Ireland will follow. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Coming up on Sky News, we'll be getting more reaction to the ongoing news about the comedian Russell Brand. Stay with Sky News.